בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה. Thank you for coming, thank you for everybody that's listening, ברוך השם. We had a lot of fans last week, a lot of new fans uh, from um, sure enjoyment that are listening in, and ברוך השם, ברוך uh, השם will uh, continue to grow the fan base. Also, Thank you to Torah Anytime that continues to publicize our shiur. Uh, you know, anyone that wants to watch any of the shiurim, go to TorahAnytime.com or go to my website, which is BeZratHashem.org. Uh, and uh, you can watch all the shiurim. You want to see the personal story that Baruch Hashem has been very, very motivating for thousands and thousands of people from everywhere. Every single day, Baruch Hashem. I get more emails from people that have watched it. And uh, I'm motivated by it to do tshuva, to change their life, to do all types of things. And uh, a lot of it, you know, it's just, uh, it's amazing to me to see how something that seems like a uh, regular story is so motivating to so many people. So, Baruch Hashem, you know, we see that there's more and more reasons of why Hashem did what He did. And uh, again, Hashem shows us how everything that He does is for the good. Because if all of that seven years of uh, difficulties and hardship was really just for the sake of one Jew doing tshuva, it was already worth it. Once you learn the value of a Jew. Unfortunately, we don't know the value of a Jew. So we think, okay, if you save a Jew, you don't save a Jew. If you keep Shabbat, he doesn't keep Shabbat. Eh, whatever, let him do what his own thing. Most Jews don't know the value of a Jew. So, Hashem shows us different ways of how much He values every single Jew. Hashem shows us different things about how much He values every single Jew. And to give you an example, if you look, for example, the uh, Jew in Hebrew is Yehudi. Yehudi. Um, and, but if you... Anyone that knows how to speak the language or knows how to write, read and write in Hebrew, knows that Dalit, the letter Dalit, looks a little like He, the letter He. Really all it's missing is this line under it. So if you actually move in Yehudi, it's Yud, He, Vav, Dalit, Yud. If you move the last Yud, the last letter of the word Yehudi, and you put it under the Dalit. The Dalit becomes a hay. So now what do you have? You have Yud hay, Vav and hay. God's name. In essence, what Hashem is telling us here is that He implanted Himself inside the Jews. He doesn't just say, listen, you're the chosen people for nothing. And we see from this week's parasha, Parashat Nitzavim, how serious Hashem really is. If we only knew how valuable each Jew is, things would be very different. Last week, in the, uh, we did a shiur, Baruch Hashem, in the Breslov Center uh, in Aventura, which Baruch Hashem has gotten a lot of views and is very popular. A group of young guys that uh, in the beginning of the shiur weren't really serious. By the end of the shiur, they were all about tshuva. Baruch Hashem, we sent all of them kiruv packages. Got some text messages, some an some questions, some answers. Uh, Baruch Hashem, everybody got motivated. Uh, and uh, the same guys that were laughing, you know, in the beginning of the shiur, if you watch the shiur, it's called Wake Up Call at the Breslov Center. And uh, you see in the beginning of the shiur, there's like you hear in the, in the background, you hear a little laughing. And then about 40 minutes into it, I stop, uh, you know, the time exactly, ooh, huh? So uh, about 40 minutes, 43 minutes, 43 minutes into it, I stopped the shiur and um, I asked him, what's so funny? Because if, it's, if everything is funny or if everything is boring or if everything is a waste of time, we have to stop. There's no point of we, me wasting my time. There's no point of them wasting their time. So if something's funny, let's all laugh. If something's not funny, let's get back to business. In so many words. And you would think... You know, this is not exactly a normal shita. This is not a normal strategy for so-called rabbis to use, to call out the crowd that's joking around and uh, ask them what's going on. Usually, what you try to do is just avoid it, ignore it, pretend like it's not happening. 
But anyone that spent even five minutes on a stage, anyone that spent five minutes speaking publicly knows that you feed off the crowd. As a public speaker, you feed off the crowd. Meaning that even though it looks like I'm speaking to you right, you know, you guys are right in front of me, and uh, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal. Like if you were sitting, if you came here for Shabbat, Bezot Hashem, you come here and you see we speak, no, no big deal. But when it's under a camera and it's under, when it's something that you're trying to give a sure lecture, or you're speaking on stage, it's completely different than any conversation. Um, and because in a regular conversation, I just talk to you. But when you're speaking publicly, you can't lose your train of thought. If I speak to you and I forget what I say, okay, I speak, no big deal. But if I'm doing a lecture, that means that I have to be 150% focused from the minute I start until you go home, three hours after the lecture. I have to be 100% focused at all times and constantly think about what I'm going to say next and pray to Hashem to give me what to say because I have no idea what to say next. So, Bezat Hashem, He gives me what to say. Uh, but you have to constantly focus on what to say and read people at the same time. You have to read their reactions. If you say something uh, and you see people's reaction, facial reaction, doesn't necessarily need to be words. You see, people's facial reaction is negative. You have to react without necessarily saying, hey, you, why didn't you like it? You can't call the guy out. If you see people mumbling after you said something, for example, anytime I mention the Holocaust, there's a, you know, and it's a big crowd, there's at least five, six people going, <laughs> there's always somebody saying, like everybody's surprised, talking about the Holocaust. Oh, this guy's daring. So you have to read the crowd. You have to pay attention to everything. So what happens when someone is not only not asking questions, but someone is actually just messing around? They walk around, they give everybody water, hey, you want coffee, you want coffee? You know, they're doing their thing, they're, not, they're acting normal. It's very, very distracting. Because whether I like it or not, I still have to look at them. Whether I like it or not, I have to look at every single thing that you do. So, and it's a natural inclination, it's an, it's, it's, it's an instinct. So, when people are joking around, or people are eating in front of you in a, in a, in a not a very polite way, you know, some people eat like animals. Uh, which is usually not, you know, it's one of the reasons why it's not always the best idea to have like a lot of food on the table when you're giving lectures. Number one, people can't do two things at once. They can't really listen to you and understand what you're saying, like actually pay attention and eat at the same time. It's either they eat or they pay attention. Uh, that's actually why Rabbi Mizrahi in general doesn't like to give lectures when there's food. He usually waits for the food to be finished. I agree with him 100%. Uh, but whatever, you have snacks, people munch on certain things to keep them awake, it's fine. But when they have like a whole dinner, or, you know, you give them a four course meal while they're eating, you're not, they're usually not going to listen to anything you say. Um, and it's not on purpose, it's just, again, it's just people. Um, so you have to make sure that you get people's focus, especially for things like this, because it's not like, a, it's not one of those, uh, you know, presidential elections that they talk for 45 minutes, but in reality, all they care about is the last two minutes. No one's going to even remember the first 43 minutes. They're only going to be reminded of it on the news when they review every single part of what they said. But in reality, everybody that was there or watched it on TV, no one remembers anything. What do they remember? They remember the last two minutes. If the guy finished off on a high, everybody claps. Wow, he's a great speaker. Wow, psh, what amazing match. Ah, doesn't matter what he said. If the words came out of his mouth in a clear way, people vote for him. If he doesn't know how to speak, it doesn't matter what he says. He can say, listen, I'm bringing down your taxes to zero. I'm going to give you money. I'm going to, you know, whatever, allow you to do whatever, anything, anything, anything you want. Build, you know, build better schools and give you guys free travel, whatever you want. If he doesn't speak clearly, this guy's horrible. How do we know this? You see this from history. What's the reason why Obama, for example, got elected? It's not because any of his policies made any sense. He actually contradicted himself during his own election. Like he would say one thing one day and another thing another time. He would say one thing before. But nobody paid attention. Why? Because he was a good speaker. You ask anybody, why'd you vote for Obama? Oh, he speaks such a good speaker. 
Everyone, everyone's which is a good speaker. What does he say though? Do you know what his policies are? Do you know what he wants? Do you know what he said? Anything? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Even to this day, people don't have an idea. Nothing. He's just a good speaker. So, to be a good speaker, you have to make sure that you're always on point. You have to be clear. You have to pay attention. You can't just like wing it like people want to wing it. Uh, you, have to, you have to know what you're doing. So, the most important part is to know what you're going to say before you say it. The difference between politicians and Torah is that, in general, with Torah, it's an evolving subject. Meaning that if you really studied the Chomel, you studied the material, and you're a you know, you're Talmud, you're a Talmud Chacham, or you're trying to be a Talmud Chacham, where you're constantly studying, not just for this lecture, you didn't study for a speech. Like Obama, you know, somebody writes a speech, he studies the speech, and he rem memorizes most of it or all of it by heart. But if you ask him to repeat the same speech two days later, he's not going to remember. Why? Because you just committed it to memory, just like when you all took tests in school. You know, you studied for the test, I don't know, three hours before the test probably. You know, you memorized everything on the test. You took the test, you passed the test, you maybe get even a good grade. If I ask you two days later what was on the test, you have no idea. No idea what was on the test, no idea about anything. As soon as you finish the test, it's deleted. It's like a beeper. A beeper is probably before your time. You guys are young. Oh, so beeper used to these these things. You alive when beepers were around? I've seen my uncle. I've seen your uncle. Baruch Hashem, say uncle. Wow, I'm so old. So beepers. Beepers were these things. They look like phones, but they weren't phones. You just call somebody. Oh, shows you how old I am. Oh. So now, now. Um, you see about the speeches. Also, Hitler knew to give a good speech. That's so what we'll get to that. Be. We'll get to that. So, uh, the key with tests, as soon as you finish them, that's it, gone. Information's gone. With Torah, on the other hand, if you're somebody that studies on a regular basis, not only are you going to know the material that someone asks you, but if someone throws you a question in the middle, it has nothing to do with anything. If you really know what you're talking about, you'll be able to answer it without skipping a beat. You answer the question, even if it's 15, 20 minutes answer, and go back to exactly to where you want to go to. Maybe you'll lose your train of thought and then get, you know, take you a few seconds to get back to it, but as far as, you're not going to forget the material because somebody interrupted you. It's there, especially if you have Seat Dishmaya. But the point is, is that we have to be very, very careful from relying too much on good speakers and the reason why just like he said one of the best speakers all time of all time if not the best speaker the best speaker of all time is Hitler Hitler as evil as he was still you know still had a very very big talent that every speaker, every president, every person would love to have. And he was a motivational speaker where to such an extent that despite the fact that he was telling people to do psychotic things, they were excited to do it because his speech was so powerful. So this should teach us to be very, very careful of good speakers and be very, very conscious of what the speaker actually says. If the speaker says something that makes sense, then if they're a good speaker, it's a plus. It's easy to listen to them. But if what he says doesn't make any sense, doesn't matter if he's good, bad, it doesn't make a difference. You know, I, uh, one of the most important speakers, or actually, not one of the most, the most important speaker of all time was not a very good speaker. Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu was not a good speaker. How do we know? He says it himself. He had a stutter. So imagine somebody's trying to tell you 613 commandments and he's stuttering the whole time. He's trying to give you all the commandments, all the laws, all the speeches, all everything, and he's stuttering. It's not easy to listen to a stutter. You have to really work on your midot to listen to a stutter. You have to have a lot of patience. Um, and of course, he had uh, also Aaron speak on his behalf and many times. But the point being is that whenever Moshe Rabbeinu spoke, 
It was the most important speech of all time. So, why was it important? It wasn't because he was a good speaker. It was because of what he said. What he said came from Hashem. So, moving on, we have, Baruch Hashem, a lot of good news. And then we're going to the parasha. One of them is that we announced uh, yesterday that CD number two is in production, Baruch Hashem. Uh, and Bezat Hashem should be out uh, hopefully within the next few weeks uh, by the time the Chagim are either over or maybe Bezat Hashem even before the Chagim are over we should already have them uh, in people's hands so CD number 2 I think is going to be even better than CD number 1 CD number 1, Mamash we uh, gave them out faster than we can print them Bo Hashem, we just ordered a few, uh, another a uh, few thousand, we're expecting to get 4,000 more in any day, and Bezat Hashem many more. Um, every day we send out another thousand, two thousand, three thousand. Every day, Baruch Hashem, people are asking for it, they give them out to people. Um, it's Mamash, something that is had a lot of Siyat Dishmaya, and CD number two, I think, is going to be ten times better. Because CD number two has, aside from having all new content. We made sure not to repeat the same lectures in it. It has long lectures, short lectures, you know, short clips that are five minutes, 15 minutes, and the long lectures that are two, three hours. You have, uh, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I, have, I don't remember having it, but it's possible. Uh, I think that whole shiur may be in it, but it has two of the most popular shiurim that we've had so far, which is, uh, you know, the, the personal story, the version that uh, talks about emunah, talks about conversion, Shiva number 94, uh, Hashem uh, took back his millions and gave me emunah instead. This is one of, this is the most popular Shiva that we have, which Baruch Hashem, between all the sites, between Torah Anytime, my website, uh, you know, YouTube, and many other places, uh, I don't even know how many thousands of people that have, have, have heard it and, and have actually connected to it, but it's uh, every day, more people. And then it has the Wasting Seed, the Wasting Seed lecture, the most comprehensive lecture in the English language about wasting seed, both scientific and uh, spiritual proofs of how someone is destroying their life here and there, uh, you know, by wasting seed. And, you know, unfortunately, there's not much material in English about wasting seeds. So this is a very big wake-up call for a lot of people that are looking for information. They're looking for information. They're not uh, biki. They're not experts in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Hebrew language. And they need information of well, what's the significance of wasting seed. And this applies to both Jews and non-Jews. So those two lectures are there, and Mabuch Hashem, much more material. Uh, and I think it's going to be uh, very, very popular. And Bezat Hashem, um, you know, people are uh, as excited about it as I am. And aside from that, today uh, we announced that tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, we'll come out with our first movie, uh, which uh, has been in production for a while now. And Bezat Hashem should be out tomorrow, first thing in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the Power of Kiruv. It's called about 14 minute movie. It's very, very good. Uh, if you guys are nice, I'll show it to you after the lecture. Since you came here, you have schut. Um, and it's good. It's, it's material from a lecture I did a, uh, some time ago about Kiruv. Um, and Baruch Hashem, a lot of other, there's another few movies, another, at least another two that are in uh, production now, and uh, Baruch Hashem, I, uh, or more actually, but Baruch Hashem, we're going to have some more coming out. Uh, when's the next one coming out? A week, a week or so, Bezat Hashem. So right after Rosh Hashanah, Bezat Hashem will have movie number two and maybe even number three. So Bezat Hashem, we got a lot of going on. A lot going on, a lot of projects. We have uh, some trips, some this, you know. So Bo Hashem, Hashem continues to uh, show us that He's very happy about what we're doing. And uh, people are connecting to it. And it's really um, amazing to me how Jews that were completely lost are finally finding themselves by just watching a clip or watching a movie and you don't really understand how much the person that sent them that clip the person that sent them that sure that they ended up watching how that person is going to benefit it's mamash unbelievable the 
Chazal tell us that each and every Jew needs to read this Parashat Nitzavim because here is when we actually start learning the, uh, the, about the whole subject about Arvut. Arvut meaning the responsibility for one another. How every Jew cannot be selfish. Every Jew has to make sure that he not only observes Torah himself, but he starts looking around at the Jews around him and the world around him and make sure that he's a positive influence. When it says in the Torah, be a light to the nations, you know, obviously the light starts within. So first you have to make sure that you're learning Torah, you're observing Torah, you're doing everything that you possibly can. Um, and after that, you have to make sure that you're projecting that light in a direction that's necessary. Now sometimes I have people that have a hard time overcoming a certain sin. They have a difficulty. They have a difficulty keeping Shabbat. They have a difficulty stopping with wasting seed. They have a difficulty leaving uh, the uh, non-Jew that they're with, even though the non-Jew has no interest whatsoever in ever being religious or connecting to God at all. Uh, you have all types of difficulties that people have that uh, they want to do everything else. But this one major thing they can't get over. Or this one major thing is like the big door that's stopping them from doing a lot of other things. So for that, there's a few things that could be done. First and foremost, most important thing that someone can do is pray. But pray for themselves. The prayer that you have for yourself is more valuable than the prayer that even the Gdol Ador can give you. Even if Moshe Rabbeinu will pray for you, it's not going to be as big as you praying for yourself. Very few people pray for themselves. Very few people. And I'll tell you a uh, story about it. Is it called cool it praying for yourself? No, but the dude is, is, a, is, a, is a level of praying for yourself. You can pray for yourself without necessarily going into complete it but the dude. You can just pray, you know. Uh, again, there's levels of it but the dude also. There's some people that can do it but the dude, which is meaning like you're alone, you know, and trying to uh, get uh, closer to Hashem by um, disconnecting from the world around you. Some people need to do it both spiritually and physically. So they go into the woods, or they go to the ocean, or they go, I don't know, some cave. And uh, they want to do it that way, like, like Sonny wants to do. Sonny <laughs> wants to go to that cave. Uh, then you have some people that can do it anywhere. I heard the fields are the best. And For I different people, you're different you're things. Now. Fields are not supposed to go. No, no because uh, you bring and the trees are growing thanks to you. Like, it's good when you're praying in a place where there's grass and trees. You said a field, not a... Not a no, woods. like a... Yeah, I do say... Yeah, woods. Like, the woods. The woods. The wood hears you, so you benefit from it, so... Why do you benefit from the wood? No, the wood benefits from your prayer. Okay, so it, how does that help you? It helps you sit. I heard something that the wood also prays for you. It's also like living. Like when you speak to a plant, good things, it dies out. When you speak, when you speak bad things on a plant, it dies out. When you speak good things, it helps it grow. Okay. When you go pray in the woods, you're actually helping the trees and everything grow no, better. I don't know. Hold on. I'm just putting it in the Listen. There's a whole new thing I learned about it. After it, it different, it. different people have different ways. There's no best, there's no worst. I can tell you that there are certain times, like for example, Rabbi Vadya. Rabbi Vadya, Zechat Tzadik I don't, I don't hear, at least I haven't heard yet. I uh, heard a lot of stories about him. I haven't heard of him going to the woods. Not once. Now, but Ravavadya was Gdolado, and Ravavadya was very, very spiritual to such an extent that there's a story, a very famous story, that when the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, came to visit him, came to visit Ravavadya. Now, it was known that Ravavadya loved every Jew that was not a kofel, gamul, 
of every Jew, and even the Kufrim, he would try to get them closer if it was possible. And paid attention to everyone, even if he didn't know you, if you were far away, you know, he heard about you, and he heard that you're going through a rough time, he stopped crying. That's how much he loved Am Yisrael. But his love for Torah and his addiction to Torah was something out of this world. And he would make sure that he, he was very, very strict with his time. As far as how much time he spent with people, how much time he spent learning Torah, he was very, very precise. So, one time, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu came to visit him. And, uh, you know, he's got secret service, he's got this, he's got that, he's got everybody. He tells Benjamin Netanyahu, comes to the uh, uh, place where uh, Rav Vadya is learning, and he tells everybody to leave, to stay alone with Rav Vadya. And he tells a story later. He said, I, I stood, I stood right next to him. Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, top guy in Israel, standing next to Rav Avadia for two hours before he even knew that I was next to him. Before he, re he realized that I'm next to him, he was so deep into his learning Torah, he didn't even know I was next to him. Two hours. Two hours. That's what Buddha did. Understand? You don't need to go into the woods. You want to go into the woods, Ashrecha ba'ashrecha kecha. But you want really Buddha do get into the Torah on a deep, deep level, connect to the words, look at their shape, analyze what they're saying, listen to what they're saying. That's it, Buddha do Get to such a point that you're so connected to the Torah, you don't have no idea what's next to you, Bechlal. That's it, Buddha do That's the level you should go to. Don't worry about where you're going, whether it's the woods, or it's the caves, or it's the mountains, or it's the sea, or it's this. Gdole Adol, the real giants of the generations. Listen, of course, some of them did this and went into these different places. But not as often as people make it to be. People make it to be like the Baal Shem Tov went, went there every single day. He spent six hours in the woods, you know, uh, you know just uh, looking at the sun. And they're much mevazim et Hashem Shiro. They're like uh, making a joke out of it. Yes, they did it, but it's not as often as people make it seem to be, first of all. And it's also, again, it's from people that spent so much time with the Torah that when they did go to the woods, they didn't stop learning. All the Torah was already by heart in their mind. So they were continuing to learn with or without the books. I'll give you another story about Rabbi Vadya. You know, he was a big giant. They asked him to speak at different places. So sometimes they'd have him speak in places that spoke different languages. So one time they had him speak in, uh, somewhere in Europe. And uh, they'd have a uh, translator. So he'd speak whatever, he, you know, he would say the Divret Torah. And then the translator would say what he's saying in that language. I think it was English or a different language, or French maybe. He would say it in that language, and then Rav Avadya will go again. Like we had, for example, in, uh, in Arizona, when we did a trip, one of the lectures, they, they, you know, there's a lot of uh, Bukharians, there was a Bukharian community, and a lot of the people, their first language is, is, uh, is, not, is not English. So they had one, of the, one of the lectures that we did, had a uh, translator. It's one of the lectures we did on Shabbat, so it's not recorded. So it was another rabbi that was translating everything I was saying. So, uh, which is tough because you have to remember what you're saying and not, you know, and listen to him at the same time. So, anyway, long story short, so Avadia says something and he stops and the guy translates. He says whatever he said, repeats everything that he said. But the guy sees that Rav Avadya continues to talk while he's translating, but just really, really low. So he says whatever he says in a regular voice, like right now. And the guy starts talking, and he's, like, and he's whispering. He's like, yeah, what, are you saying something else? He goes, no, 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 go, go, continue, continue. And he continues to talk. So, okay, continues. 
Then he, Rav Avadiyah say, he stops, Rav Avadiyah says the next two, three minutes worth of speech, and the guy repeats it, and again, Rav Avadiyah is whispering to himself. He says, Kudav, did I miss something? No, 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 go, go, continue, continue, continue. After the third or fourth time, the rabbi wanted, you know, Rav Avadiyah didn't want him to... Uh, Continue asking him every every time. It's going to be a long speech. You'll be there all night if you keep asking. He says, no, don't worry, don't worry. I'm just studying Mish Mishnayot. I'm just studying Mishnayot. So I don't waste. So I don't waste time. When you're talking, and telling them what I said, it's, it's for me. It's a waste of time. So now you're going to talk for two minutes. What am I? I'm just sit there for two minutes, do nothing. I didn't come to this world to do nothing. I didn't come to this world to go into the woods or the caves. I came here to learn Torah. Right? So during those two minutes, I'm studying Mishnayot. While he's giving a lecture. Why he's giving a lecture. Remember a story about when he ate the bar of soap? Oh, wait, instead of, yeah, I can He has no, no idea that, yeah. That's All like, this Chachamim, Chachamim have no idea, no food, no nothing, nothing. They, the they food is just to survive. It's a different world, so that's what I'm trying to explain to you guys. How come when you ate the soap, though, it didn't taste? Because <laughs> there's no concept of, of, of this world. They can disconnect it from this world. Mama's disconnected from this world. So, you want to you wanna work on something? You want to be like, you want to be like one of his Talmidim? You want to be like the, you know, Baal Shem Tov? You want to be like Moshe Rabbeinu? You want to be like all these giants? One way. It's not two ways. One way. Learn Torah non-stop. Non-stop. To such an extent that you disconnect yourself from the rest of the world. The more you learn Torah, the more disconnected you're going to be from the rest of the world. As long as you care about what the rest of the world looks like, or thinks like, or wants like, you're still not connected to it at all. So, again, it's a... Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a lot of work. It's possible. Everybody can be. Everybody can be major. It's all a matter of, of what you're willing to put out there. What you will. How much work you want to put out there. So. But to give you a little bit of a idea, of uh, tefillah. And how valuable are your words? And uh, to to finalize this point, uh, about uh, tefillah, people go to rabbis all the time. Very big rabbis all the time. And ask them for blessings. They uh, somebody has a family member that's six Balminan, they ask for a blessing. Somebody is going the wrong way, they ask for a blessing. All different things. Somebody lost money, they ask for a blessing. Everybody asks for blessings. They usually ask for blessings for somebody else. If you ask the guy, do you pray for yourself? Pray for yourself. You know, let's say the guy's sick. Do you pray for yourself? No, I don't pray for myself. Sounds weird. The rabbi, he's got all these schuyot. The rabbi has all these schuyot. He pray for me. No. Torah says your prayer is more significant than any rabbi in the world. Your own prayer for you is the, is the most important prayer in the world. But if you pray for someone, someone else, you get, you get that uh, uh, blessing toward, toward Me'achuz, you. Me'achuz, yeah, it's different. That's different. You pray for somebody else, you also, whatever you pray for them, you could potentially get for yourself, 100%. But the value, the level of your prayer for him is not going to be as high of a level as your prayer for yourself. Just like if somebody else prays for you, it doesn't matter who it is. It could be a big rabbi, it could be uh, your mom. She prays for you, it's not going to be as high of a prayer as you for yourself. And i explain to you exactly why. Now, in the uh, prayer, there's three three levels of prayer that are the highest levels of prayer. The three highest levels of prayer. The first one, the highest one, we know is Tfilat Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu. How do we know Moshe Rabbeinu's prayer is so high? Because we know that when his sister, Miriam, made a mistake and said Lashon Ara about him, trying to help him, but she said Lashon Ara about him, Hashem punished her. 
punished her very, very severely, he gave a tzarat. And the entire nation started praying for her to heal. Millions of people prayed for her to heal. It didn't work. It didn't work. Then Aaron Cohen comes to Moshe and he begs him. Begs him, Moshe, she's our sister, she's our blood. Pray, pray to Hashem to heal her. Moshe Rabbeinu says five words. Five words. Not five tefillot. Not five hours, not tefillat shmona yisrei, not a week, not a month. Five words. Five words, she's healed. Meaning that his, Moshe Rabbeinu's prayer was bigger than the entire nation combined. Moshe Rabbeinu. We have in Tehilim, Psalm 90, we hear about Moshe Rabbeinu's prayer. The, the psalm begins with tefillah Moshe, Isha Elohim. Adonai Ma'on Ata Lanu Bador Bador. A prayer by Moshe, the man of God, O Lord, you have been an abode for us in all generations. So here we hear about Tfilah Le Moshe. You see, are you Moshe Rabbeinu? No, I'm not Moshe Rabbeinu either. You're not Moshe Rabbeinu. So it doesn't really help us. So then you have Tfilah Le David. David HaMelech was so significant, such a tzaddik. The Gemara says that anyone that says that David HaMelech sinned with Bathsheba, which the Christians think that he sinned, and unfortunately many Jews that are ignorant also think that he sinned. Everyone that says that David Melech sinned is completely wrong. David Melech did not sin. Number one reason, well, as far as Bathsheba, number one reason is Bathsheba at the time that David Melech was with her was not married. It was customary for all people that went to war to give their wives a get, to get divorced as soon as they left. Meaning that when he was with Bathsheba, she was not married. Number two. In case he didn't come back, right. If he doesn't come back, in, you know, how are you going to get to get? Right, she's available. She's available. That's number one. Number two, kings have different rules. Number two, kings, when you're king, it's not king like Le'avdil, uh, Obama, or Trump, or Hillary, or whoever, Hussein. It's not, it's not like that. King in Am Yisrael is picked by God. No election. God picks the king. God tells the prophet, Samuel, Nathaniel, whoever, go tell the nation, this is the king. Aha, maybe he's a false prophet. How do we know? So, Hashem makes sure that there's no doubt. No doubt. What happens? He brings the prophet with the oil of the Mashiach. It's a certain oil that Moshe Rabbeinu made. And he would put this oil on the king, on the new elected king by Hashem. Now this happened with David HaMelech. Now until David HaMelech was elected king, it was a big problem. His father, Ishai, which was Gdolador, didn't actually think that David Melech was his real son. Lama? Because at the time that, uh, right before David Melech was born, there was a suffix, there was a doubt of whether he's able to be with his wife anymore. Because of the whole issue with the Alakha of uh, being able to be with a Moabite. And also because she wasn't able to bring children to the world. Some say it's because of this, some say it's because of that. Nonetheless, the point is that David Melech's uh, mom was a big tzaddikah and she said to Ishai, listen, you have a mitzvah, pool, pool. you have to bring kids to the world. So if you can't be with me or there's no point of you being with me, Bechavod, be with the maidservant. Mitzvah. 
It's not like today where the wife doesn't want you to go to the store just in case you don't come back. Back then, they had uh, number one priority was following the Torah. So anyway, so this maid servant was a tzaddikah, and she says, "Listen, he should only be with his wife. He should only be with his wife, and Bez Hashem will have another child with his wife. You already had sons. You already had a bunch of sons. He says, be with his wife." So what did this maid servant do? The maid servant said, "Listen, you, you know, I'm, he's going to think he's going to be with me, but instead, I'm going to sneak out of the room and you." You go in the bed. And back then, it's not like today where you have lights and all that stuff. Back then, if it was dark, it was choshech. So it's dark, dark. You can't see anything. So what she did is she had David Melech's actual mom, you know, Yishai's actual wife, uh, in the bed. So he actually slept with his own wife. And this time she got pregnant. They didn't see that she was pregnant two months later. No, so now, when he saw that she's pregnant a few months later, he says, how could it be? I haven't been with you. Maybe you cheated on me. And she told him the whole story. She goes, no, I didn't cheat on you. I just, I has, Hashem blessed us and he gave us, a, he made me pregnant this time. He goes, it's not possible, I wasn't with you. And she told him, yes, yes, you were. So... They made a deal. Well, listen, I'm, you know, you're still the mother of my other kids, and it's still a suffix where they're always with you or somebody else. Hard for me to believe, because why would you hide it? Long story short, he says, okay, I'm not going to kick you out to the streets, but I'm not going to be with you anymore. Because in case you were with a different man, I'm not allowed to be with you. I'm not going to throw you in the street and kill you either. So upset him. So now when David was born, Everyone thought he is a mamzel. Everyone thought he was a child of an illicit marriage, illicit relationship. His own father, Gdolado, one of the four people that never sinned in his life, thought that David was not really a son. And the brothers didn't exactly treat him like he is, uh, you know, one of them, they didn't care for him too much. So now one day, the prophet comes to, Hashem, comes to Ishai and he says, Listen, Hashem sent me. And he says that one of your sons is the, uh, is the king. And so Ishai immediately brings his sons, his Firstborn son, good looking, smart, Torah scholar, tzaddik. Psh, look at this guy, perfect for a king. So the prophet takes the oil, tries to pour it on his head. The oil is going against gravity, it does not come out of the bottle. He's trying to pour it, pour it, it's not coming out of the bottle. So, okay, so he's not the king. The next son, tries to pour the oil on him, it's not coming out. Which is, by the way, this oil is where we get the word Mashiach from. Because the oil is the oil Mashiach, meaning that they Moshech, they're rubbing the oil on the, on the king. They would do this for the king, and they'll also do it for the Kohen Gadol. Would have to use this oil. Um, and give him certain type of kedusha and levels that is beyond our understanding. Anyway, we... Uh, he tried with the second son, the third son, the fourth son, the fifth. Nothing. Not, nothing works. So they ran out of sons. He's like, okay, so you have to have another son. He goes, no, no, I don't have another son. It's one of them. It's one of them. He goes, well, Hashem makes a mistake. You have to have another son. One of your sons, Hashem said, is the king. He says, well, I may have another son. He's in the fields with the sheep and the uh, cows. Because bring him. Bring him in, this little red-headed kid. So they go bring him. And what happened, according to Chazal, the Midrash says it was a miracle. To make sure that there's no doubt. The prophet was sitting with the uh, oil at one end of the uh, house. And David comes in, the other end of the house. 
And as soon as he comes into the house, the oil jumps out of the bottle and connects with David in midair. My gosh, like a, one of these sci-fi movies, that's where they got it from. A miraculous, mystical event where the oil goes on David and it's as obvious as can be, he's the king. So when Hashem wants you to know something, needs you to know something, there's no doubt. He doesn't leave it to any doubt. And this is where it says in Tehilim that uh, as soon as he was elected king, they say, uh, we thought that this was a wasted stone, but the wasted stone ended up being the, the headstone. Because in those days, you know, you cut stones to make a building. But there's certain stones, if you want to round it off, you cut the, you know, the, the, the corner of stone, you cut it, you throw it out. So he says that this, this piece that you throw out usually, we thought it's just a wasted stone, it was a despised stone, there's nothing you can do with it. That stone ended up being the headstone, meaning that just like, for example, the Washington Monument, Washington Monument is a building in Washington, D.C. That everyone knows this building. It's a famous building around the world. Why do they know the building? Who remembers this building? They remember the look of it as far as the top. The top of the building is the most memorable part. The headstone is the top part. It's the most important part. So just like we thought that this kid was not really important, not even one of us, he turned out to be not only the uh, important, but the most important. Became... David HaMelech, King David. Many, many people, Baruch Hashem. So now you have uh, everybody gets embarrassed, but then, you know, they say, listen, this is obviously a Maaseh Elohim. This is Maaseh Hashem. This is Hashem making this. This is purely from Hashem. There's no, Hashem didn't leave us any doubt. He made sure that we know that King David is King David. So now, we go back to the tefillah. We see that King David, who didn't sin, and anyone who says that he sinned is making a mistake. King David here, Psalm 17, it says tefillah to David. So there's a certain level of prayer from David Amelech, very high prayer. And he was so connected to Hashem that he would fill up a cup every day full of tears. Every day, a cup full of tears. That's how connected he was to Hashem. He would sleep like a horse, they'd say, meaning they'd sleep for 15 minutes and wake up. 15 minutes, wake up. 15 minutes, wake up. That's it. No enjoyment whatsoever out of this world. They were chasing him his whole life. People would try to kill him. Every single moment of his life, people were chasing him. Every single moment of his life was struggle, but... He never left Hashem. He never, him. never left Hashem. Got to such a point, Bar Minan, we had a uh, Ben Sorer, Ben Sorer Umore, he had one of his sons that uh, went against him, wanted to kill him, Avshalom. Avshalom wanted to kill him. One of his sons killed his other son. Ken, 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 Ken. Yeah, yeah. He had this disaster of a uh, situation as far as life according to our uh, understanding, but he got to such a point that he became the fourth pillar, the fourth leg in Hashem's chair. So, David HaMelech, Filah David. But then you have, then you have people in the world, they're not David, they're not King David, you're not King David, I'm not King David, you're not King David. There's no more King, there's only one King David. So where is this going to help us? It's not going to help us. Okay, so we're not Moshe Rabbeinu, we're not David the Melech. We're the average guy. Barely. Barely that even. So you have a third prayer. Third prayer, that's the highest level. Higher than both of them. Filat Ani. The prayer of the destitute, the poor. 
the poor person, his prayer is the highest. You go to Psalm 102. It says, A prayer of the afflicted man when he swoons and pours forth his supplications before Hashem. Hashem, hears my prayer and let my cry reach to you. So here, the Vida Melech is telling us, Tefillah Le'ani is the highest. Why? Because he's living his prayer. He's living in constant sorrow. It's not like if you bring a chazan, Gemara says in Masechet Ta'anit, you bring a chazan, make sure to bring a chazan that's poor. Don't bring a chazan that's rich. Why? What's the rich, if the guy, the rich guy, he's praying during Yom Kippur, what are you thinking about? He goes, oh, I can't wait to get out of here so I can spend the twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 they are giving me to be chazan for the chagim. That's what he's thinking about. Go on vacation, go this, go that. What are you thinking about? He's thinking about, I can't wait to go to Bahamas. Can't wait to see what my portfolio did during this chagim. What is he thinking about, Bechla, this chazan? He's thinking about his money. But the ani, the poor... What is he thinking about? He's like, I hope my children don't die by the time this Chag is over because if I don't get them bread as soon as possible, they're not going to survive. I hope that they actually give me the money they promised. I hope that Hashem gives me enough strength to finish the prayer because I haven't eaten in three days. Tefillah Le'ani, the poor, is living in sorrow. When he's crying during prayer, he's crying about real things that are happening to him right now. He's not crying about a portfolio. He's crying to survive. That's the highest level of prayer. I see a poor person, they say, give them to the cupboard, ask them for a blessing. But now, Baruch Hashem, none of us are poor. It's not like a poor guy, gave him money with both hands and give him a nice blessing. Can? God, yeah, ask him for blessing. Yeah, even an idiot, even someone that's a common person, you could ask him for a blessing. It's always good. But, Baruch Hashem, there's only one Moshe Rabbeinu, Baruch Hashem, there's only one David Melech, and Baruch Hashem, nobody here is poor. So how's this going to help any of you? Remember, I started this by telling you the most important prayer you have is the one you do for yourself. So David HaMelech tells us we can do that. In Psalm 86, Psalm 86, David HaMelech tells us a very secret, a very big secret about prayer. That every single one of you needs to use this Rosh Hashanah, it's coming up in a few days. A prayer of David. So David the Melech is praying. Hashem, incline your ear, answer me, for I am a poor and destitute. David the Melech is telling us, if you pray with all of your heart for yourself, cry to Hashem, be sincere with your prayer, your prayer can be chashuv like Dani. You don't have to be a poor person. But you can pray like one. Because even David HaMelech says, My prayer as David HaMelech is not enough. I want the prayer of Dani. So if David HaMelech says that he wants the prayer of Dani, not only does it mean that Dani is even better, it's even higher, but it means that anybody can do it. And you don't have to go to a cave. You could pray in the Beknesset, Bezat Hashem, Shana, and cry to Hashem. Beg Hashem to help you with your tshuva. Beg Hashem to help you with your modesty. Beg Hashem to help you with conversion. Beg Hashem to help you with tshuva for your family. Beg Hashem to help you with mitzvot. Beg Hashem to help you with limut Torah so you can get past page one. Beg Hashem. Cry to Hashem. You're pouring mitzvot. So... Now, my mom, God bless her, she reminded me of a story today. Why did I think of this? 
I'm thinking to myself, did I ever do this? Baruch Hashem, I prayed many times to Hashem. And during the whole time that I, uh, you know, with the conversion and everything else, I used to pray a lot, very, very strong prayers, Baruch Hashem. But she reminded me today of a story, something that happened, that Mamas gave me a little bit of a uh, perspective of how the Bach how this really works. Now, what does it mean to be poor? Poor doesn't mean money. It could be money. But what does poor really mean? What does destitute really mean? Destitute means you have no choice. You're out of choices. You go up to Hashem, I raise my hands, I have no choice, I have no hope, I have nothing. All I have is you. Meaning, you have money, but... You're not going to ask Hashem for money. You have money. So even if the check didn't come in on time, you still have a few thousand dollars in the bank. You're not desperate. But if you have a negative balance in the bank, now you may be desperate. But you know that there's a check in the mail. You're still not desperate. Your check is in the mail. You're not desperate. But if you have a negative in the bank and there's no check in the mail and there's no customers, nothing. You're sitting home looking at the TV while the Otsala Paul comes and collects, you know, Tzala Paul in Israel, they, uh, they come and you owe money, you start taking your furniture. Repo, yeah, they come take your furniture. They're taking your television, Baal Hashem, take the television as soon as possible. They're taking the couch, yeah. it's better for you anyway. Taking the couch, you're taking this. So you're sitting over there, you have no idea what's going to happen, but you're still thinking, okay, I still have enough stuff, maybe I'll sell the couch they didn't take. You're still not destitute. When are you destitute? When are you destitute? When one of your kids says, Abba, I'm hungry. And you have nothing to feed them. When one little kid says, Abba, I'm hungry, your whole world collapses. Your whole world collapses. When, because that's when you realize, I have nothing. I am nothing. I have no other hope other than Hashem Barach. I have nothing. So, before really doing tshuva, you know, we got a lot of tests, Baruch Hashem. My mom told me this story today, Mama, she put me in perspective. How Hashem gets you to a point, like he says in his parasha. long time ago we got to a point where it's maybe uh, four years maybe into the sickness and uh, got to a point where I was getting much like surgery after surgery after surgery after surgery is well, much became like an experiment and uh, but then one day the infection that I got was different was different than all the other infections usually the infections that I would have were very very painful but you get familiar with them you know your skin was still the same it's just that you felt like you had like a I don't know like a golf ball or something inside your skin you can't wait for it to get out but here I had a infection that made my skin like rubber. A mush like rubber, very, very strange. And the doctors told me, we're oh, sorry, it's in an area that's a uh, very sensitive and uh, we'll have to have the surgery and we have to pretty much cut the whole part out. We have no idea what it is. We haven't seen this. And we have to just cut it out. Because it's an infection and we have to cut it out. Now, based on what they were telling me, surgery goes in, pretty much. I'm not gonna be able to have, I'm not gonna be able to have kids. And I'm also not gonna be able to go to the bathroom by myself permanently. 
And who knows what kind of life I'm going to have after this God-forsaken surgery. And on top of it, when I'm in the hospital, even though I've had a bunch of surgeries before this, this time I don't feel like I'm going to wake up. This time I feel like I'm going to go to the surgery. I'm not waking up. And it's the first time I started looking at, like, I just felt, had this bad feeling. Surgeries, like, I went to sleep a bunch of times. I went to, you know, anesthesia a bunch of times already at this point. It was like everybody knew me already. You know, it was a process. He puts injection, okay, you go to sleep, uh, get a nap. Whatever, you wake up with some pain sometimes, but usually you have morphine in your system. Oh, Hashem, other than the first surgery, the other surgeries, as long as they had, they had morphine already ready for me, it's fine, the recovery was okay. But this time, I had a bad feeling. Good hospital, good doctors, no, no problem. Everything was the same. But this time, I feel like I'm staring the Malach HaMavit in his eyes. But it's not something you see. You just feel it. You had a hundred surgeries before. It doesn't make a difference. Right now, this one's different. This one is different. And I'm shaking, petrified, because in the next few minutes, they're supposed to come take me to the surgery. And there's no, I don't have a choice. I don't, have day, I don't want to have the surgery. Can't. This infection is spreading rapidly. That Shemarachem, what can happen? So you rather take off a piece of your body than uh, nobody. I'm petrified. Break down. I have no idea what to do. Um, mamash, I feel like I'm thinking of, I thought about it but today. Mamash. Saying goodbye, this, that, but everybody says, you know, you say, listen, I didn't want to live, I didn't want to live, I didn't want to live. You know, I told you guys I was like suicidal and didn't want to live, but when you get to that point, all of a sudden you want to live. All of a sudden you want to live. All of a sudden, the guy that was suicidal wants to live. So my mom, God bless her, says to me, read Tehillim, read for you. I pray for you all the time, read for you. Hit Tehillim number six. I heard it's good. And I used to hate when my mom would give me prayers. I had no connection whatsoever to religion. I just, you know, whatever. It was When she, she would pray for me all the time and she would give me blessings when she would see me, I told her, Ima, stop blessing me. God hates me. My mom, that's the level that I got to. Oh, so much pain all the time. How could God like me? Oh, Hashem, now I know Hashem loves me more than everybody because... Look what he put me through to get to here. But when you're in the fire, all you can feel is the pain. But this time, I had no choice. She gives me Tehillim. I said, yeah, okay, give me, give me the Tehillim, give me the Tehillim. I just start reading nonstop. I read Tehillim number six. And it's the first time I'm reading Hebrew and who knows how long. And I'm crying and I'm reading and this. And as soon as I finish reading the Tehillim, the doctors come, sir, come. They take me. I would never forget this feeling. I go, they put me on the anesthesia. I wake up, they put me back in the room, I don't feel any pain. I wake up, first of all, I'm surprised that I woke up Ikhlad. Then I'm sitting there and I don't feel any pain. Usually there's pain. There's nothing connected to me. There's no pain. So I'm thinking, did I die? Like what, what happened? I don't know. I start seeing my wife, my mom. Okay. What happened? And the doctor comes in. We have good news and we have bad news. Okay. What's the good news? What's the bad news? Good news is we didn't cut anything. There's no surgery needed. Wow. Amazing. Okay. What's the bad news? We have no idea what it is. But it's not an infection, it's just something else. We'll give you some medicine and it'll work. Something that was supposed to destroy my body forever. Tfilat Chesar Oni. When I hit rock bottom and finally I raise my hands to Hashem, Hashem Barach, I have no other choice. The money I have is worthless. The friends I had, worthless. 
Everything is worthless. The only thing I have is Kaleem number six, and I'm reading it over and over again, trying to even understand what it says. But all I can do is cry to Hashem because that's all I have left. That's Tfilat Chesed Oni. When you get to Rosh Hashanah, remember this story. If you want Siyat Dishmaya with your learning Torah, you want Siyat Dishmaya with Zivug, finding a good woman, finding a good man, you want Siyat Dishmaya with children, you want Siyat Dishmaya with anything in your life, pray like it counts. Pray like it's the only thing that you have. It's the only choice. Once you do that, that's when the door is open, wide open. Because now it shows, ah, that's the prayer I was waiting for. You know? Let's say you have like good opportunities for business. And you make a lot of money, you become rich. Does that mean you could like lose your health because you made millions? One thing has nothing to do with the other. Millions and have a perfect life and every like how millions Torah could that all come together? As many sages that were very very rich, many some many sages were very very rich. Some of them suffered. Some of them didn't suffer. Some brought suffering on themselves. But you have to understand: the closer you are to Torah, the less valuable money becomes. But the money doesn't mean it will take you get hit on something else if you have. No, money. one thing has nothing to do with the other. One thing has nothing to do with the other. Because some people say, if you don't have money problems, you have another problem coming. Like, you say money problem is a good problem. Like that, that's the only problem. It's a better to have a money problem than to have other problems because money you can replace. You can always make money. Money is just paper. It's a tool. It's like a hammer. Use a hammer to, you know, smash a nail into the, into the wall and, you know, with other time you have a picture. If the, uh, if the hammer breaks, you eventually get a different hammer and that's it. You replace it. If you can't afford a hammer, you get a rock. So, same thing with money. You know, so you can replace it. But, chas shalom, somebody doesn't have health, you can't replace health. Somebody doesn't have a spouse, you can't replace a spouse. Even if you have a new wife or a new husband, it's never going to be the same one. You know, so that's, that's one of the things that uh, people need to understand, is that money is not as valuable as people think it is. It's, a, uh, it's actually much less valuable than people think it is. And uh, also, even though I said it in my mind, I'll say it um, before I forget. The uh, shiur also goes to Refuash Lema, to um, uh, David ben Nesriya, Levana Batsara, uh, and also to Ilui Nishmat, Keila uh, Rut Bat Bunim Tuvia. And uh, also to Nasriya Ilu Nishmat Nasriya Bat Miriam. May Hashem raise their souls and give them many, many more schuyot. And with uh, Hashem, give everybody a rufuah shlema. Um, you had another question? Like okay. a thing when I growing up, I heard this from like rabbis and people. Mm -hmm that most rich people are not happy. Yes. But you could be rich and happy. You can be rich and happy. You can be rich and miserable. Feel, most rich like people most are... poor people are not happy either. But poor people are happier than rich people on the average. And the reason why is because poor people have something that a rich person can't have hope. in most cases, which is hope. Rich person has what he thinks is everything and then when he realizes that his car, his house, his uh, jet, his company and all those things are all material, they're all replaceable, they're all disposable, he uh, could very easily lose hope when he has no spirituality and you have many many examples of multi-millionaires and billionaires killing themselves uh, or doing stupid things like drugs and much destroying their life because uh, once they have everything Material and they realize they have nothing at the same time. They have no hope the poor guy Always has this illusion that the only thing he's missing is money So he's thinking that once I get money Then I'll show you guys what it's like to be happy. So he always has hope the rich guy already has money So it's better to be miserable and poor than miserable and rich 
Either way, you can be you can be happy both ways. But happiness is a, is something that most people don't understand. Uh, meaning that happiness is not a uh, physical or material feeling. It's not dependent on money. It's not dependent on people. It's dependent on spirituality. If you are connected to the source, you'll be happy. If you're not connected to the source, there's no way for you to be happy because happiness is a spiritual feeling. It's not a physical feeling. So in order for you to have happiness, in order for you to have a spiritual feeling, you have to increase your spiritual intake. You have to feed yourself, you have to feed your soul spirituality. The only thing that's spiritual in this world is the Torah. So if you have no Torah, if you have no connection, you'll have no connection to the Creator. If you have no connection to the Creator, you'll always have this empty space. You may be happy with your career to an extent. You may be happy with your marriage and your love life to an extent. You may be happy with your kids to an extent. You may be happy with your vacation to an extent. Everything is to an extent. Everything is limited. And even then, every, most things are generally temporary. You're happy with your wife, but not all the time. You're happy with your kids, but not all the time. You're, not happy, you're happy with your job, but you wouldn't work there if you were going homeless. So it's, everything is to an extent. Whereas real happiness, spiritual happiness, depends on nothing. Doesn't depend on money, doesn't depend on people, doesn't depend on anything. It depends purely on your connection with Ishtabach Shemo. Ishtabach Shemo, Hashem gives you a, when, he connect, when you connect to Him, He gives you a feeling like you cannot get from anything material. So, if people actually understood this and implemented this into their life, they wouldn't look for happiness anywhere else. And this is also why the closer you get to Hashem, through his Torah, the less connected you are to anything material. Because why do people want something material? Why do you want money? Why do you want a car? Why do you want a big house? Why do you want all these material things? Because you think that if you have them, you'll be happy. But I feel like it does help, like a nicer car. To be happy car, helps, feel, helps no way whatsoever. Sure, like, I feel much you feel right now, because again, you're at the level that you are right now. If you are higher level, you would care less of whether you even have you have a box or a house. The higher level you are as far as connected to Hashem, the less connected you are to anything material. To such an extent that even Rebbe, Rabbi Yudan Nasi, that was the equivalent of a billionaire in his day, his generation said, and the Gemara it says, who is someone that's at a level to be the Mashiach of our generation? Everyone says Rebbe. Zadam Muslam, he's a complete person. He's smart, he's a, he's a tzaddik, he's rich, he's powerful, he's you know, connected to the uh, uh, Caesar. BFFs with Chavuta, with the Caesar. I mean, it's a mamash, like he's, he's got everything. But Rebbe himself said, I didn't enjoy my money, I didn't even enjoy a penny of all my money. Absolutely. Nothing. I enjoyed nothing of the material world. Why? Because he was so connected to Hashem that he asked for suffering. He asked, he prayed for suffering to come to him. All, those pains he got, he All types of pain, prayed for it. He got it he did it one part it. of the pain he got for because he prayed for, one part of the pain he got because he uh, needed to get it to do complete tshuva. But nonetheless, he was completely disconnected from this world. Yeah. So for the people that can't read uh, Hebrew, if they read the Tehillim in English, does, yeah. it, does it make a difference? Sure. I mean, you have to understand what you're reading. You have to understand what you're reading. It's very, very important for you to understand what you're reading. Um, and uh, so, if you're able to understand what you're reading in any language, read it in the language that you understand. If you're able to teach yourself Hebrew, then teach yourself Hebrew. But until then, learn it in English and then... Compare and, you know, look at both sides and eventually say it in Hebrew. It's obviously a higher degree if you say it in Hebrew, but nonetheless, it's worthless if you don't understand a word that you're saying. Like, people that just make sounds, you know, and they have another option, it's not worth as much. 
So, for example, what me, for example, reading that Tehilim, I understood some words, but it wasn't, it didn't depend on the words. It depended on the fact that my heart broke. Reading those Tehilim, whatever I said, however I said it, all I knew is that I was in dire straits. I was destitute, I had no choice, and the only way that, you know, I knew how to connect to Hashem is through prayer. So I just read Hebrew words, but had, you know, different words in my mind and different feelings, and I had a broken heart. So, most people that read Tehilim without understanding them, without understanding what it says, doesn't get them anywhere. But if you actually understand what it says, you read it in English and Russian and uh, whatever other language there is, Spanish, uh, it's pretty much you have Tehilim in every single language. You actually uh, know what it says and understand the meaning behind it, it can get even a stone to start crying. The reason why I ask, you know that uh, Holy uh, Nation book? Ken. Uh, it says, I forgot what, I think it's on page like 46, it says that if you read it, even if you don't understand it or if you're not fully concentrated, mm -hmm. um, it's still, you still get a lot of... Uh, Okay, that's parts of the Zohar. The Zohar is the only thing that they say you can read without understanding what it says. You still, you still has a certain amount of schut uh, for reading it because number one, most people don't understand Hebrew, let alone Aramaic. Uh, and uh, number two, it has a certain uh, darga according to some, uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, sages that if you just read it by itself, it's already enough. But there are certain things that if you have an option, you should read it in the language that you understand. Uh, like, for example, if you read Gemara, the Oral Torah, the foundation of Judaism, and you don't understand a word that you're saying, you're one of these heroes that knows how to mix the sounds but doesn't understand a word of Hebrew, and you continue reading it in Hebrew, you're an idiot. You're wasting your time completely. I see people all the time, they barely speak he uh, English, let alone Hebrew. They look at it, and they're reading just the Hebrew part. I'm looking at the Hebrew, and I'm like, the guy's looking at the page, and he flips a page. Wow, it's not only reading, he's fast to read it, too. Yes, the guy, does he know Moshe Rabbeinu? He has no clue what he's talking about. Nothing. But he's reading, he's reading, he thinks he's doing good. What are you reading, Bechla? You don't understand anything. Read it in the language you understand. So that's the thing. You have, there's certain things, yes. Certain things you can read and not understand, there's a certain ma'ala to it. There's a certain, you know, thing that's significance to it just by the sound of the words. Like, for example, prayer in the Sidu, if you can, it's preferable that you read it in Hebrew. Even if you don't understand, uh, but have some level of understanding. So first, it's important for you to practice by reading it in English initially and then eventually getting to the Hebrew. But the goal is for you to get to the Hebrew. Because prayer, the chazal, the, uh, the, the sages, uh, made sure to write certain words using the holy language that make a certain sound. That according to the teaching, the holy uh, sages, uh, Hashem likes to hear those sounds. So if you read it in English, does it... Yes, you still have significance. 100% you have significance. It downgraded versus it's reading. less than Hebrew, yes. It's always going to be less than Hebrew. It's always going to be, because Hebrew is the holy language. Hebrew is the language that Hashem created the world in. Everything is less than Hebrew. But, just Hebrew with pure sounds and no understanding is also less than Hebrew. You understand what I'm saying? Like just making sounds, if you don't know what it means, then how, how, how is it going to help you? You understand? So, it's again, there's, there's levels. There's level one, level two, level three. There's... Ideally, it's to speak Hebrew with, a, uh, with complete understanding. But until we get to that point, we have to train ourselves to get there, Bezat Hashem. So now that we've finished the introduction of the Shur, an hour and a half into it, we're going to a few things into the parasha that are very, very interesting, very important, uh, because I think what we're missing today is a full understanding of the risk we face by being secular. Most people think, you know, be a Jew, you're religious, that's your choice. Not religious, that's also your choice. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? You're religious, you keep mitzvot, fine. You want to believe in this olam ba? God bless you. It's your business. You don't want to believe. You don't want to do. Fine. What's the big deal? 
you're still considered Israeli, and according to the non, according to the uh, secular people, you're still considered Jewish, and even according to the uh, non-Jews, you're still considered Jewish. Even though Allah says someone who doesn't follow Torah is putting his Judaism on suspension. So let's see what the risk here. Moshe Rabbeinu is telling Am Yisrael Parashat Nitzavim. אתם ניצבים היום כולכם לפני אדוני אלוהיכם, ראשיכם, ושבטיכם, סגניכם, ושוטריכם, כל איש ישראל, טפכם, נשכם, וגריך אשר בקרב מחנך מכותב עציך עד שואב ממך. You are standing today, all of you, before Hashem your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders, your officers, all the men of Israel, your small ch- children, your women, your converts who are in the midst of your camp from the hewer of your wood to the drawer of your water. So in here you're seeing Moshe Rabbeinu emphasizing that this is relevant to everyone. Everyone is standing before Hashem whether you're a man or a woman, you're a governor, you're a president, you're a you know, homeless guy, you're a convert, you're a uh, tzaddik, you're a rash- whoever. Everyone, little kid, big kid, everyone is included. For you to pass into the covenant of Hashem your God and into His imprecation that Hashem your God seals with you today. He's saying to you, make sure that you know that right now we are, this is the Brit, the Brit, the covenant, the deal is between all of you and Hashem. But, continues. In verse 13 it says, I'm sorry, in verse 12 it says, in order to establish you today as a people to Him, and that He be your God to you, that He be a God to you, and he, as He spoke to you, and as he swore to your forefathers, to Avram, to Yitzchak, and to Yaakov, not with you alone do I seal this covenant and his imprecation, but with whoever is here standing with us today before Hashem, our God, and whoever is not here with us today. So whoever is here, and whoever is not here. What does it mean, whoever is not here? Future. Future. Baruch. This is relevant to everyone. The deal is with everyone. Someone says, listen, it's not my fault Moshe Rabbeinu signed this deal with Hashem. What does that have to do with me? The answer is, you never see an apple complain about the tree, saying, listen, what's it my fault that this tree decided to grow? You have the resources from the tree, You depend on the tree. You have to live by the tree's rules. Simple as it gets. You can't just decide to not be part of it. And this is why it uses the word imprecations, meaning that consequences. Consequences of not following. Whether you were there or you were not there. So the first thing that he tells us here is that aside from this deal being for everyone, there's a major thing that's considered detestable to Hashem, something that He considers an abomination, something that He considers disgusting, that you have to be careful with for all time. In verse 16 He says, And you saw the the abominations and their detestable idols of wood, and stone of silver and gold were with them. So he gives you four different types of idols. And he says, make sure that you never worship an idol. Make sure. We'll come back to that. He says, and it continues, that if There is among you a root flourishing with gall and wormwood. 
And it will be that when he hears the words of this imprecation, he will bless himself in his heart, saying, Peace will be with me, though I walk as my heart sees fit, thereby adding the watered upon the thirsty. He says, if one of you decides to explore the philosophies of the Goim, decides to look at different education systems, says, listen, I'll, do as a, I'll walk as my heart fits, meaning... I'll do whatever feels right to me. I'm a good person. As long as I don't murder people, I'm a good person. As long as I don't steal from people, I'm a good person. As long as I'm a good person based on my own definition, I'm a good person. He does what his heart sees fit. Whatever he thinks is good, it's good. And he says, and he's, and he's adding water upon the thirsty. What's adding water upon the thirsty? He says, Chazal says here, Rashi says, watered is when you make sins that are not intentional. You don't know it's a sin. You learned Alachot of Shabbat, but you didn't get to all the Alachot. It takes a while to learn all the Alachot of Shabbat. You didn't know that grinding a tomato on Shabbat is Chilul Shabbat. Same like I didn't. Shabbat as lighting fire? Huh? Let's say you lit a lighter or you grind it. Is it the same karet? Trill Shabbat. Because I heard like carrying little is not as bad as lighting fire. Right, there's a, there's, 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 there's Rabbanan. Yeah, there's Rabbanan. You only get Malkot, I heard from. Right, there's different levels, but nonetheless, it's uh, grinding is one of the 39 restrictions. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing as fire. Same thing as fire. Um. Whereas the whole aspect of Iruv is Rabbanan. Iruv is Rabbanan. Wait, could you carry on Shabbat? No, you're not allowed to carry on Shabbat. Of course not. You're allowed to carry on Shabbat if you have Iruv. Yeah. Iruv. But nonetheless, if you're learning Alachot of Shabbat, you just didn't get to the point, you didn't realize that grinding a tomato on Shabbat. It takes seven years. So, it's a Chilul Shabbat, but it's not intentional. Because you're learning, you just didn't get to it. She so says, that's water. That's like shogging. Shogeg. <coughs> it says, word of the thirsty, meaning, it's not that you did it with you didn't know, meaning you got comfortable with the shogeg. You got comfortable with making the sins. You didn't really care that you're making a sin. You got so comfortable with it that you stopped bothering even caring and eventually start doing it intentionally. So once it became intentional, Torah says, Hashem punishes you both for the intentional and for the stuff you didn't do intentional. When you didn't do it intentionally, it doesn't, it doesn't punish you. You don't even know it's a sin, Bichlal. You scan the guy's born in a jungle. He doesn't even know he's Jewish. He's going to punish him for not, being, not knowing he's Jewish. He lives in a jungle. His best friend's a monkey and a lion. He's not going to punish him for that. But if the guy lives in the middle of Boca Raton, in the middle of Brooklyn, in the middle of somewhere in New York, California, Israel, all these different places full of Jews, and chooses to drive on Shabbat, Hashem is going to punish you for the things you know and the things you don't know. It's like when you look at uh, something you matters, the first time it's a free look. The next time you get punished for the free look. It's not look. really a free look. It's look to see where you're going, not a free look. No, it's not like a quick... You didn't it's like not a, intentional, uh, you know it's there. Right, you know something is there. It's not, yeah, stand. but saying it's a free look, saying you can get a quick look at everything. It's not true. No, if you already you know, if you know there's a demut, there's a body of a woman coming in a certain direction, you don't need to look. How do you know if you don't look? Because you see in your, your, your peripheral vision. There's a peripheral vision. You can see without looking. You can see, I can see where, that you're next to me. And even certain parts of your body by looking straight at sun. It's called peripheral vision. And also the ions. The ions. <laughs> so let's stay on point. So Hashem is telling you, be careful. This all starts because you started making your own rules, saying that I'll do whatever feels good to me. If keeping Shabbat feels good to me, I'll keep Shabbat. If uh, keeping kosher feels good to me, I'll keep kosher. If Shomer Nagia, not wasting seed, feels good. You know, it's, if it's convenient for me, I'll do it. But if I have a girlfriend, I'm not going to do it. You start making your own rules. He says, in it, what's going to happen is, you're going to start with small little sins that are not, you know, that are not intentional. Then they're going to be 
not intentional, but still you don't really care, you're going to stop caring, your Yirat Shemaim continues to deteriorate little by little, and eventually you start making them intentionally not caring at all. Now he's telling you something here, everyone needs to understand. Verse 19, chapter 29, verse 19. For all of those people that have no idea about the Midat din judgment from Hashem, you need to read this verse. Lo yovea Adonai sol es, se lo achlo ki az yaishan af Adonai bikinato ba'ishahu, ורבצה בו כל העלה הכתובה בספר הזה ומחה אדוני את שמו מתחת השמיים. השם will not be willing to forgive him. For then השם's anger and jealousy will smoke against that man and the entire imprecation written in his book will come down upon him and השם will erase his name from under the heavens. השם will set him aside for evil from, uh, from among all the tribes of Israel, like all the imprecations of the covenant that is written in his book of the Torah. Remember what we learned in Parashat Bechukotai, all the curses. Remember what we learned in Parashat Kitavo last week, the curses, all the disasters. Hashem says, the guy that knows, but goes off the derech, doesn't care anymore. There's going to come a day Time runs out. And all of the punishments, Bar Minan, Bar Minan, all of the punishments of the Torah are going to come on his head. I'm not going to forgive him until he does Chuba. I'm going to keep punishing him and punishing him and punishing him until he does Chuba. So all those people say, no, no, but Hashem, I'll understand. When I get up there, I'll understand. I'll understand. No, he's telling you right now. He's not going to understand. As a matter of fact, it says in the Gemara, Masechet Baba Metzia. Or Baba Kama, that anyone that says that Hashem is a vatran, meaning he just lets go of things, mevatrim oto, mevatrim oto, meaning they cut him up into pieces just for that. Today, someone told me in the gym that whenever I want to come back, he'll accept me. Whenever I want to come back, yeah, he'll accept he you. Whatever he wants, Hashem will accept him, like whatever he wants. He's right? right that Hashem will accept him. The only question is, how does he know he has more time? He's right. No, Hashem will accept him. He says it here in this parasha, we're going to get to it. He'll accept him. How do you know you have more time, though? Because he's going to go. Point is, how do you know you have more time to, to, for you to come back? What if he, the guy dies tomorrow? He goes to chance. Ah, okay, time's out. So, then he says here, Hashem <sighs> Achem. The later generations will say, your children will, who will arise after you, and the foreigner will come from a distant land when they will see the plagues of that land and its illness with Hashem has afflict, which afflicted it. He's saying that the land, he's going to destroy the land. After he kicks you out, he's going to destroy the land. It's going to turn, the whole land is going to be like Yom Elach. Sulfur and salt and conflagration of the entire land, it cannot be sown and it cannot be sprout, and no grass shall arise upon it, meaning you're not going to be able to grow anything on the land, like the upheaval of Sodom and Gomorrah. Just like what Hashem did to Sodom and Gomorrah, turned everything into Yom Melach, He's going to turn the whole land. You can't even grow an apple tree. And this is exactly what happened after Choban Bet HaMikdash. For 2,000 years, you weren't able to grow anything. And then the prophecy here, he says it's a prophecy, verse 23. And all the nations will say, For what reason did Hashem do this to this land? Why this wrathfulness of great anger? Even the Goim are going to come and ask, What happened to this land? This land we heard about, this land of milk and honey. This great land. What kind of punishment did this land get? Why is Hashem so angry at this land? People just read this verse, don't think it's a big deal. But this is actually a prophecy. A prophecy that came true. A prophecy that came true over a hundred years ago by Mark Twain. Mark Twain famous, uh, wrote a lot of famous book. 
Uncle Barry Finn, and a few other books that were uh, very, very famous. He actually went to Israel, before modern-day Israel, and he said that even an olive tree, olive tree or cactus, nothing, nothing grows on this land. No fruit whatsoever grows on this land. Even the certain types of trees that can grow on rocks with no water whatsoever, he says even that was not growing there. Because there were no Jews. 100%. But the point is he's saying that this, this is supposed to be the land of milk and honey. And he says in his writing, why is God so angry at this land? He mamash fulfilled the prophecy, obviously Hashem, put his, put his words in his head, in his goy's head, to write, like it says in his verse, what happened to this land? Why is Hashem so angry? Mamash, came true over 100 years ago. I still see pictures of, have a look, 100 years ago. Can, 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 Ma'achuz. So now, when I get to the point and then answer the question we asked before. So after you ask this question, they say this, verse 24, and they will say, because they forsook the covenant of Hashem, the God of their forefather that he sealed with them, when he took them out of the land of Egypt and they went and served the gods of others. So now, and it continues, but now it says that Hashem is really angry because we served other gods. Who are these gods? We said here in the first page, in verse 16, it's Vaivin Kesev Azav, the god of wood, stone, silver, and gold. It's four different gods. Hashem got really angry, destroyed the land because of idol worshiping four different gods. We had a nice chidush, Baruch Hashem, of both explaining who these four gods are and connecting it to the question of why it's very dangerous to be secular. Now, Etz Vaevin, we already answered in previous weeks. Obviously, the, we already discovered in previous verses in chapter 4 of the book of Dvarim, Sefer Deuteronomy, Etz Wood is referring to Christianity. Even, meaning stone, is referring to Islam. Very simple, those two. We already went over them. So Hashem gets very angry when you go to as these false gods, these false religions, especially when the Jews leave the endless ocean of the Torah and go to a hole in the middle of the desert full of scorpions and rats. So you go to these false religions, Hashem gets extra angry at the Jews. But that's the first two. What's Kesev Azav? Okay. Now if you say Kesev Azav is just one God, then why would Hashem just put, put two words for it? So Kesev means silver, but also means money. So just like we talked about also in previous weeks, Kesef means money. You look at the dollar bill today, it says in God we trust. And the reason why is because most people have turned money into God. They work endless hours and forget about Hashem. The one that actually gives them money, they forget He exists. The one that gives them Parnassah, they don't want to pray to Him. The one that gives them everything they need in order to do anything, they don't even acknowledge him. So they made money into a false god. And the fourth one, Zav, is what Zav? Who is the who are the people golden that calf. usually usually golden calf, right? But who is the ones that uh, uh, usually have wear a lot of Zav? Show off, pride, Chazaku Baruch. Oh, so you're in the business still, Baruch Hashem. Good, good. Okay, so that makes me happy. So. Zav, meaning gava, meaning show off, meaning parking your brand new BMW or Mercedes Benz in front of the Bet Knesset so everybody knows you got a brand new car in Yom Kippur. <laughs> meaning the guy that wears enough jewelry to make 50 cent jealous. 
Meaning the guy that's showing off all of his fancy things while he has the guys that are learning to all day begging for change so they can feed their six kids. That guy. The guy that has his gava so high, so high, that he forgets who's God. And it says in the Torah several places, in Masechet Sukkah, page 29, for four reasons a person loses every dollar that he has, everything he has. And the largest one out of the four is bigger than the first three. What is it? Gava. Pride. Pride is worse than the other three reasons of why somebody loses money. There's four reasons, but pride outweighs the other three. So this is the Lama Masechet Ta'anit, page 8. This person that has pride brings anger to the world. Mamash brings judgment to the world. Hashem gets so angry when someone acts with pride, shows off who they are and what they think they are, whether it's showing pride with their what they think is good looks or brain or anything else. Hashem gets disgusted from Gava to such an extent that he says that in a place that the person is, has gava, Hashem cannot be there. He cannot have his shechina. He says there's only one God. If he has gava, he thinks he's God. There can only be one God. I can't be in the same room as him. Now gava, unfortunately, is not a sin by itself. Gava leads to other sins. So in the Gemara Masechet Sota, page 4, so every man who is prideful eventually falls for Eshet Ish. Someone that's very prideful can eventually fall for a married woman. Which that one gets him into not only to lose a share of the world to come, but to go into a place in Genom that doesn't end. And here we use, they use, in, also in the Gemara Masechet Sota, uses this verse, one of the sources, says that every man that has gava, that's prideful, is like an idol worshiper, who made all of the sex crimes they are, and made a koban at a time that's not allowed. Meaning that having pride is a multitude of sins. It gets a person as far as possible from where he needs to be, from that cave you guys want to be in to pray, to connect to Hashem, as far as possible, something small like Gava, we think it's small, can destroy the relationship a person has with Hashem Barach. Now, now we've talked about Gava in the past. Why am I mentioning it now? Rabbi, Achav, did he fall for Ashish because he was a very good Gavtan? Achav had Ruch Shanut. He had a big desire for money. It was also Gavtan, but it's it spoken about it last week, yeah. Mm -hmm. So now, why am I mentioning this guy? We talked about Gava plenty of times in the past. I've mentioned some of these verses in the past. We always have to have new stuff. What's the, what's the uh, point? Why am I mentioning it now? It's because Hashem is telling us here that someone that doesn't follow his laws... He's going to start making up his own rules. Eventually, he's going to worship these one of these four different idols. And the punishment is going to be that Hashem is going to wipe him out. Who? The Doeg. Yeah, so Hashem is going to wipe out all of these people. Generally, sin is connected with Gava that most of the time. Almost everything is because of this? They, it starts there and it ends somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So now, most people, when I tell them, listen, being religious in Judaism, it's not a choice. It's not a choice. It's not the best option. If someone wants a good life, even in this world, it's the only option. 
It's not that, oh, listen, Olam Abba, Olam Abba, Olam Abba. Most people don't believe in Olam Abba. Let's just be honest. Most people don't believe. Even sometimes, even righteous people that are like, you know, trying to do mitzvot have a hard time connecting to Olam Abba. They still suffer in this world so much sometimes. They have a difficulty thinking about Olam Abba, thinking about past the point that they're in, the wall that's in front of them. So it's tough. But being religious and following the Torah, it's the only option you have. I'll explain to you why. When you follow the Torah, you have instructions from the manufacturer of how to preserve the product. He created a product called human beings. Certain type called Jews. They said, I chose those Jews. And it's specific instructions they have to follow. If they don't follow it, a lot of bad things happen. It breaks, it gets ruined, gets rusty, punishments, all types of not fun things. But what they don't realize is that if they do follow, not only are they going to end up benefiting in this world and in the next world, but they're also keeping themselves away from self-destruction. Meaning that if they don't follow these rules, they're eventually going to kill themselves. Not that I'm going to kill them. They're going to kill themselves. It doesn't have to be suicide. Now, a lot of people have asked a lot of questions about the Holocaust. So, Baruch Hashem, we're doing some research more and more. Baruch Hashem, more information. And Siyat Dishmaya gives us this is much different things. So, before the Holocaust, the Jews in Germany and overall Europe were in top positions, especially Germany. Germany was the America of its day. And the Jews in Germany got to a point where they considered themselves German, not Jews. To such an extent that the Jews in Germany, according to a uh, uh, recent uh, statistics that I looked at, also from this movie called Nazi Collaborators, he mentions it in the movie, plus a few other statistics that I saw online, in some parts of... Uh, of uh, Germany, not only was there 80% assimilation in Germany specifically, but the ones that assimilated actually converted to Christianity and Catholicism. They didn't just assimilate like the guy had a, uh, you know, a, a, a Christian girlfriend and she stayed Christian, he stayed Jewish. No, he actually went through a conversion process. Like but this wasn't the beginning. This wasn't the beginning. This was something that started well, well before Germany. In the book, To Remain a Jew, I got as a present from one of my students, Albert from California. May Hashem bless him. It's a fantastic book. Thank you, Albert. Called To Remain a Jew. To Remain a Jew. It's by one of the Ador, Rabbi Yitzhak Zilber. To remain a Jew. To remain a Jew. And he was there during the Holocaust. You have pictures and tells what happened. And he asked, he asked how did you not just remain a Jew, remain a ultra, ultra, ultra Orthodox Jew. <clears throat> like the best of the best. And he writes a whole book about it. And he tells about the story that no one wants to hear. What was Judaism like in those days? She says that there is a Jewish section, Yevsexia, was a general name for the Jewish organization of the RCP, which is a uh, revolutionary communist party of Bolsheviks. 
After the revolution, the communists created a national section within the party that was supposed to implement the communist ideology among their own. In other words, to convince people to build socialism in their native language. Members of Yevsexia mercilessly fought the remnants of the past, their own parents' faith. Now, who is he talking about? Is he talking about the Russians? Is he talking about the Germans? Is he talking about the Christians and the Catholics? No. He's talking about the Jews. The Jews that were communists, that became worse than all the Nazis. They closed synagogues and mikveh and forbade kosher slaughter of animals and those who taught Torah were put in jail. No one ever spoke about this, kosher slaughter? Not allowed to eat kosher, not even allowed to slaughter or anything. Continues. He says, Germany is Amalek. Germany is Amalek. We learn this from Gemara Masechet Megillah, page 6b. Why is Germany Amalek? It wasn't just exposed that Germany was Amalek during the Nazis' time. Germany was exposed as Amalek already during the Crusades. When the Jewish communities of Speyer, Worms, and Mainz were massacred by a band of knights and peasants led by notorious Count Emicho, inspired by Peter the Hermit in Machimo. Those Jewish martyrs are mem memorialized by the Avarachamim Avra prayer that we say on Shabbat, which was written by an anonymous German Jew. Now, why is he talking about Amalek? He writes. And why is it connected to Yevsexia? He says, because Yevsexia, these Jews he's talking about, which closed the synagogues, executed, killed rabbis, forced Jews to work on Shabbat, undoubtedly also Amalek. Jewish, but they're also Amalek. It was a big group of them. Huge. If one person does wrong, it's one thing. But if he's trying to prevent others from acting correctly, that's Amalek. He continues, and then we'll go to the next source. It sounds like the Jews back then were worse than the Jews today. The father of scientific communism, Karl Marx, Karl Marx was the son of Jewish parents. The guy that pretty much was the main guy behind communism, which is anti-religion, anti-Judaism, anti-Torah, was a Jew. But they were his parents were baptized when he was three years old. And this false messiah, this guy that everyone thought was a big deal, this Karl Marx, succeeded in drawing many followers. Many of them belonged to the type of people about whom the Engels used to write... A Jew is a revolutionary by his very nature. He is brought up on the ideals of prophets about the equality of, um, and brotherhood of all people. A substantial percentage of the members of the communist parties of all the countries in the world are Jewish. Jews were the avant-garde of the Russian Revolution and were the fiercest enemies of the religion and their fathers for a half a century. This is well before Nazi Germany. Over the last 200 years. They bear the blame for the mass assimilations of Soviet Jews. With their assistance, Lenin and Stalin destroyed our ancient culture. They harassed brothers who learned Torah and Hebrew language. We remember well their own faith, the former members of the party, the executioners, revolutionaries of Jewish origin. Almost all of them died in the same cells that they had sent their brothers who stayed there true to their, stayed true to their God and their own people. Most of the small percentage of survivors regretted their past. Many upon their release repented and returned to Judaism. 
So here he's telling you the biggest problem, the Amalek, that no one really wants to acknowledge, was Jewish people. Now I've heard some of this before, but now I had some new stuff. The good stuff. This movie called Nazi Collaborators. You can get it for free on YouTube or other places. Nazi collaborators, the Jews that fought for Hitler. Meaning Jewish people that were on Hitler's army. Now there were many, many Jews that were not were either not a hundred percent Jewish, meaning they only had uh, one parent that was Jewish, or they had three grandparents that were Jewish and one non-Jewish. So the Nazis called them Mischlingers. What's Mischlinger mean? Called them mutts, like a dog. Very, very insulting word. So obviously we already knew ahead of time the Nazis didn't care for the Jews whether they were full Jewish or not full Jewish. But these Mischlingers were very, very secular and very, very patriotic. They loved Germany even though Germany hated them. Even though Hitler already wrote a book before he became number one, he wrote a book talking about what he plans to do to the Jews and how much he hates them. No one took his word. Nah, he doesn't really mean it. He's not going to do it. He's such a good speaker. He's such... So what do they do? They put him in power. These Jews. They put him in power. They voted for him. They ran the country. They funded it. These Jews wanted six million Jews to die. These Jews ended up working for him. They fought for him. The historian Dr. Brian Rigg puts this thing together and he talks about all of these German Jews who supported and fought for Hitler. Meaning they were on his army, they ran his government, they ran the concentration camps. They killed their brothers and sisters. In 1939, Germany attacks Poland and wins. They advertise as propaganda a blonde-haired, blue-eyed soldier as the model symbol of the Aryan soldier. They say this is what an Aryan soldier, a Nazi, looks like. They get, the Nazis get embarrassed later on when they find out that this Aryan soldier is actually named Goldberger. He's a Jew. Phil Marshall Milch, one of the Nazi leaders, one of the head people. His father was Jewish. But because he was such a high place in the Nazi army, he says, I'm going to decide who's Jewish and who's not. So he had his mom write an affidavit, a letter, saying that, no, no, his father is not really the father that uh, you think. Really, his real father and the father of all six of my kids is my lover, who is my uncle, who died. And he was a Nazi Aryan like you. Denied his own Judaism and continued killing Jews. Yimach he only went to jail for seven years after World War II. Edgar, Edgar Jacobi, full-blown Jew, mother and father Jewish. He was actually a former Hollywood producer, movie producer. Patriot of Germany, decided to come, falsify his identity, and he fought for the Nazis in their army. He went out of his way to fight the Jews. He went and he fought the war against France and beat France in May of 1941. But then when they found out that he has Judaism in him, they transferred him to the same place they transferred a lot of these other half-Jews, partial-Jews, 
Mishlingers, they put them into a place where they would just work in the area where uh, Hitler needed them most, which is to build him more weapons, build him more stuff so they could kill more people. Eventually he was thrown in jail, this guy, and he survived the war. Karl Heinz Le uh, Lervy, not only a Jew, came from a religious family, but decided to go off the derech. No, who needs Judaism? I'm going to be a nice guy. Like it says in his parasha. Who needs the payers and the kova, you know, the hat and the beard and going to minyan three times a day? Tfilins, come on, it's too much. Ah, I already went last year, it's enough. So decide to go off the derech. What happens when you start going off the derech? It says in this parasha, you start worshipping the Eitz, Vaev, and Kesef, Azav. You start worshipping false idols, one of them. It's either you worship, you're going to Christianity, or you're going to Islam, or you're going to money, or you're going to Gava. You want kavod from your friends. You pretend it's something else, but in reality, you want to be popular. So what happens with Karl Heinz? He became a major soldier inside the SS. Inside the highest level of Nazi soldiers in Nazi Germany. Fighting wars, killing Jews, killing everybody in sight. These people deserve These like are a special place in getting on, but doesn't even exist. <laughs> <laughs> like they, uh, the point, the but here, but here's the, the point, here's the point, here's the point here. Hashem told us. He told us what's going to happen. He told us what's going to happen if we don't listen to him. It's story. not about, it's not about just the saying, you're not going to have Ulam Abba, you're not going to have Gan Eden. Hashem knows his creation. Hashem knows most of you don't really believe in Ulam Abba 100%. You have a Safik. Safik. You know what Safik is? Doubt. Safik, numerical value, gematria of Safik. Equals Amalek. If you don't work on answering this Safek, Balaminan, a person, a Jew, a kosher Jew, came from a Jewish household. Both fam, both parents, religious Jews. They don't give this little kid some answers of where God came from. Why does he care if I do not let you die? Prove to me that the Torah is divine. Prove to me that he cares if I waste or I don't waste seed. You don't start asking, you don't start answering these kids' questions. He's going to have a safek and Balminan can turn into Amalek. That's what I'm trying to tell you here. It's not just about the secular guy who doesn't even know why, what's the difference between him and a cow. I have a dear friend of mine. I love this guy. I want to ask my friend for 20 something years. One time we have a conversation a couple of years ago. I talked to him, you know, obviously there's a difference between you being a human and, uh, you know, and the monkeys. And, and I wanted to get to a point. He's like, no, I don't really think there's much of a difference. Hmm. Oh. So he's a real Mama, like, really? You don't think there's a difference between you and a monkey? So how come you don't walk around naked? Obviously, you're just saying that. Because if you didn't think there's any difference between you and a monkey, you'd walk around naked and eat bananas all day and you'd go in a cage. If you think there's not, no difference between you and a monkey, why don't you go visit your uncle in a zoo? Look at Africa. So that's it. The people are full of it. They just don't want rules. No one wants rules. Why? Because they have a suffix. They have a doubt. You have a doubt. There's a question. Is, is the doubt self-made? Or is the doubt real? Do you want to answer this doubt? Or you created this doubt because you don't want any rules. If I give you the answer, will you care? Or you will just find another suffix? Like some I have another want guy. Answer. They don't I want answer. answers. I tell, my friend tells me, don't argue with him. He never wants his question to answer. He wants it to be open so you can continue living like this. He wants no to continue suffix. He wants to continue living on suffix. I have a guy. I have a guy. 
I have a guy answer, asks, honestly, every question is worse than the other. Only the Kufrim ask these questions. And I try my best. I try my best to answer this guy's questions and get him religious, get into this, get into this. Now, now we got to a point where I answered all these other questions. He starts creating questions. But creating questions that have nothing to do with anything. Why is this Jew acting this way? What do I know? Am I God? Do I, 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 judge, I judge how he acts? Do I care how he acts or he doesn't act? Why is this guy doing this? What do I care why he's doing it? He has a suffix like you do. What, what does it have to do with Shabbat? What does it have to do with kosher? What does it have to do with God? Okay, but why is this rabbi saying this? He really hurt my feelings. Get a spine. Stop getting your feelings hurt by somebody else's words. Like, that's what you really want? Come on! You know, like, are you, are you looking for an excuse to, to continue being a Mechalit Shabbat? And that's the thing you have to ask yourself. Do you have a safek? If you don't have a safek, how come you're not doing all the mitzvot? How come you're not doing all the mitzvot? I don't think I know all the mitzvot. Okay, but there's a mitzvot. You're doing all the mitzvot that you know? All of them? I try. Okay, Baruch Hashem. Whoever is not doing all of the mitzvot, that they know of, ask yourself why. You get to Rosh Hashanah, you say, Ela Melech, Ela Melech, God, the King, the King. In the days of the, of the Beit HaMikdash, when the Rishayim surrounded the Jews, Rabbi Yochanan wanted to get out to go try to negotiate with them. Eventually he sneaks out because the Jews, there was a section of them were also part of Amalek. They were also anti-Jews, anti-Judaism, anti-Torah. Birionim they called them, Birionim. They didn't want anyone in or out of Yerushalayim. I thought they're going to win the war with their muscles. So Rabbi Yochanan had to be snuck out of the Beit HaMikdash. How? Out of Jerusalem. How? Pretend like he was dead. Pretend like he was dead. So he said, okay, I'm going to pretend he's dead. They're going to open the uh, casket. They're going to see you're not dead. And if you're not dead, they're going to kill you then. So what are you going to do? So, no, put a dead animal on him so he smells really bad. They're definitely not going to want to open it. They're not that much of a kufrin, right? <laughs> they get to the gate. The Jew says, who is that? Oh, it's Rabbi Yochanan. He goes, okay, let us see. He goes, no, come on, it's, it smells really bad. He's like, no, 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 we want to see. They were that big of a kufrin. They were Amalek. We want to see. No, it's, come on, if you open it, the goyim are going to see us opening the casket of one of our sages. And it's a shame. Okay, fine. Let us stab the casket a few times to make sure he's dead. He's got a Nazis. Amalek. Amalek is what I'm trying to tell you here. Amalek is where Nazis are. I say, oh, yeah, but that's even worse. The Goyim are going to see us, they're stabbing one of the Jewish bodies, one of not only Jewish bodies, you're stabbing one of the sages, it's bizayon, it's disrespect to the dead. Even the Goyim don't do that. Finally, they let him go to him. He arrives, they bring him to one of the Caesars, to one of the uh, leaders, but not the king. It says, and Abi Yochanan says, Your Highness, the King, I came here to make a peace offering. And he says to him, I should kill you for two reasons. First of all, you just called me Your Highness, the King, I'm not the King. Abi Yochanan says, Yes, you are. Because Hashem wrote in the story that He's only going to give Jerusalem to a king. So if you're given the power to destroy Jerusalem, that means you're king. And as soon as he finished the sentence, 
one of the messengers came and says, hey, breaking news. Like I announced today, breaking news, there's a new movie coming out tomorrow at 8 a.m. So breaking news, they just voted you new king. Voted you new king. Says Rabbi Yochanan, how'd you know? He goes, I knew because it's written in our Torah for, by, by Hashem himself. He's only going to give the power to beat the Jews to a king, somebody important. He's not going to give it to just anybody. No newspaper boy is going to take over Jerusalem. It has to be the king. Goes, okay, so I have another reason to kill you. If you knew I was the king, three years I'm outside your gates. Where were you until now? Why did you wait three years to come ask me for peace offering? Why did you wait? If you knew I was the king, how dare you wait so long until you come and tell me you know I'm the king and ask me for forgiveness, ask me for mercy, ask me for anything. Hashem is going to ask you the same thing on Rosh Hashanah. If your prayer during the year was half or non-existent, if you only started putting kippah as soon as you came to the Beknes and on Rosh Hashanah, but the rest of the year, there's no kippah, there's no tzitzit, there's no tefillin, there's no Judaism. Last Shabbat you were on the beach in Miami. The Shabbat before that were in Las Vegas. But now you're crying to Hashem, Hashem help me, my panasai is not as good. My girlfriend is this, my wife is this, my kids are this. Ela Melech, God the king, God the king. Okay, so if I'm the king, where were you until now? Where were you until now? That's what you have to ask yourself. Do you have, no, they didn't kill me. Do you have a suffix? Do you have a question? If you don't have a question, then how come you're not doing everything? Everything you know and learning more. If you don't have a suffix, you have to ask yourself, where were you until now? If you do have a suffix, is it a suffix that you're asking and you want an answer? Or you just want to continue justifying your lifestyle? And in case it's the second, in case you're trying to justify your lifestyle, and you just want to be a nice person, just know that the Germans that lived before Nazi Germany became the Holocaust, they were also nice people. As a matter of fact, Germans were known to be the most polite people in the world. Polite, very polite people. Rashaim and Rashaim, but very polite. They'd say thank you to the Jews going into the concentration camps. They tell them thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm not joking, they met. They were also nice, but nice to their definition, not the Creator's definition. So being Jewish, it's not a choice. If you're born a Jew, and you want to stay a real Jew, you want to stay a real nice person, you need the Torah. You want to have a chance at happiness, you need the Torah. You want to have a chance at success, you need the Torah. You want your kids to not be Nazis, you need the Torah. Because behind all of these stories, we're not just in... Germany, where you could say, oh, this was just one place. It was also Russia. It was also similar stories in other places. It was also in America. The main problem that we had in America was that most of the information about Nazi Germany was not published in America. They only published small little stories here and there. Why? We went over this in the uh, previous lecture at some point a few months ago. The main guy running the New York Times was a reformed Jew, anti-religion, anti-everything, but wanted to still have a little Masoah to call himself Jewish, so he was a reformed Jew. So he just did the Jewish people a favor. 
in his mind by just not reporting not reporting the fact that they're being slaughtered hundreds of thousands of them each and every week you didn't feel like reporting it so the world didn't know at least not in America I heard America had to do also with a lot of deaths of Jews because they rejected a, them. They rejected them, and B, they could have bombed their railroads, and then they couldn't take Jews to concentration camps. They were anyways flying over the railroads, but they decided, you know, let them take the Jews to the concentration camps. Okay, but the problem is that the, the problem is we're relying on that is that Americans didn't owe us anything. Yeah. They're gleam. Israel gave a long shot a few Jews. Said that, but the point is that Americans don't owe us, don't owe us anything, so you can't really go to complain to them. Like if you if, if an American saves us, well, Hashem, great, thank you very much. But you don't really have to. There was a few who did. But the Jews, you can go against. Why? Because you you do owe your brothers. They're your brothers. They're your sisters. They're your cousins. They're your parents. How can you hide their death, their massacre? How can you even not only hide it, join the enemy? That's somebody you have a problem with. But how do you get to that point? By trying to be nice. Trying to say that you have your own definition of nice. So now, we'll finalize in the last point of what Hashem is telling us. Listen, if you're not going to do all these things, you're not going to go worship these four different types of idols, you're not going to start making your own rules, you're not going to go and become a Nazi, you, wanna, you want to actually start learning Torah, here you have a concept of tshuva in this parasha. Veshavta ad Adonai Eloecha veshamata bekolo ki kol asher anochi mitzavecha ayom atahu banecha bechol levavecha ukhon nafshecha. And he says here in chapter twenty, uh, chapter thirty, verse two, and you will return unto Hashem. Return meaning tshuva. Shavta comes from the word tshuva. And you will return unto Hashem your God and listen to His voice according to everything that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and all of your soul. Now you do tshuva, just like your friend said. Yes, Hashem will, will accept you back. Then Hashem your God will bring back your, cap, uh, back your captivity and have mercy upon you and He will return and gather you in from all the people to which Hashem your God has scattered you. And here the next verse, chapter, uh, verse 4 in chapter 30, answers the question that a lot of people have about, do we have to move to Israel? A sheikh is around the corner. This whole chapter, chapter 30, in, Parashat, uh, in uh, the book of Deuteronomy, talks about prophecies of what's going to happen at the end of times. Mashiach. So it says here that um, what's going to happen when we finally do tshuva? So a lot of people ask, since we're in messianic times, we've talked about it before. Mashiach is around the corner. Should, should, does everybody need to move to Israel? And I've always told you guys, your soul needs to move to Torah. Where your body is, is irrelevant. But people don't like to hear my voice, so I will just provide some Torah sources. Chapter 30, verse 4 says, If your dispersed will be at the ends of heaven, meaning it doesn't matter where they are. End of the world. From there, Hashem your God will gather you in, and from there, He will take you. Hashem your God will bring you to the land that your forefathers possessed and you shall possess it. He will do good to you and make you more numerous than your forefathers. So he answers the question. It's not about where your body is. It's where your neshama is. You do tshuva, you have nothing to worry about. You have to be where you feel closer to Hashem. If you are close to Hashem here, in America, in Germany, in uh, wherever it is, in Tahiti, in wherever it is, but you actually have Judaism there, you're not in a cave by yourself, you're part of the Keilah. You have a minyan, you have a Jewish community, you have a school for kids. Which by the way, Allah is, we learned from this parasha, 
If you want to build a Jewish community, you start with the yeshiva. Then you build a shul. It's the opposite today. You build 800 shuls, barely any yeshivas. Alakha is first yeshiva, the Talmud Torah, then shul, then synagogue. Then synagogue. Synagogue comes second. That's the actual alakha. A lot of people don't follow alakha. Anyway, Hashem says, first get close to me. First follow my laws. First follow my voice. First follow what I wrote in this book. Then we'll worry about where you live. Now, if you are religious, you have Parnassah, you have Shlom Bayit, everything is fine. Wherever you live doesn't make a difference. If you feel you'll be closer to Hashem and still have all those things, you're still going to have Parnassah, you're still going to have Shlom Bayit, everything's going to be even better in Israel, move to Israel. It's better, much better, of course. But if it's going to create Shlom Bayit problems, if you have no idea how you're going to survive financially, you're going to leave a good job, you're going to, you know, you, know, you have no idea what's going to happen, but you think that, you know, by going over there, it's going to make you better. Why? And if the fear is, I don't want to miss the boat, Mashiach comes, what I'm going to do, I live in America. Here you have a source in the Torah telling you exactly. If you do tshuva, this whole chapter talks about it. You do tshuva, it doesn't matter where you are. Hashem will take you from the ends of heaven. The ends of the world. You could be in Mars. You could be in Mars. I'll take you from there. I'll put you in Israel at the end of times. You have nothing to worry about. You just have to do tshuva. And what if you say, listen, it's very, very hard. It's very hard to do tshuva. It's very hard to keep Shabbat. It's very hard to learn Torah every day. Maximum I could do 15 minutes. Maximum I could just listen to Shul Torah. I can't open a book of... I can't open the chumash. I can't read a book. I have ADD, they tell me. I have ADHD. Everybody today has HDAD. Anyone that's ABC. below ABC, ABD, whatever. Everybody has something else. Everyone that's below 30 years old, all of a sudden is sick mentally. PlayStation, no problem. And the TV's on. Sports, no problem. But everyone has attention deficit disorder. By the way, there's no such thing. It's complete nonsense. It's actually laziness. But anyway... You don't have any laziness to fix, to learning how to fix watches. You don't have any laziness to learn how to fix uh, all types of electronics. You don't have any laziness to fix the things you care about. But here's the problem with, what, with this effect that you have, this doubt that you have. Hashem did not put you in this world to fail. And Hashem knows exactly what you can do. So He gives you the answer for anyone who says it's hard for them to do tshuva. He says this, chapter 30, verse 11. For this commandment that I command you today, the commandment of doing tshuva, tshuva is actually doing tshuva is actual commandment. It's an actual mitzvah. This commandment that I command you today, it is not hidden from you, and it is not distant. It's not so far from you. It's not so it's such a big deal like you're saying. And it continues, lo says it's not in heaven for you to say who can ascend to heaven for us to take it to take it for us so that we can listen to it and perform it it says it's not so far that you have to go climb to heaven or send somebody over there it says go get it for us and then we'll listen no no it's not there nor is it across the sea for you to say, who can cross to the other side of the sea for us, to take it for us, so that we can listen and perform it. It's not also, you don't have to cross the ocean, you don't have to go to Israel to go learn Torah. It's also at home, it's also in your tablet, it's also on your phone, it's also on the WhatsApp, it's also in the 20 groups that we have, Baruch Hashem. It's also on TorahAnytime.com, it's also on Bezad Hashem.org, it's also on DivineInformation.com, it's also everywhere. You don't have to go cross the ocean, you don't have to go find Gdola Do and only learn from Him. Hashem made it very, very easy. It's on your phone, just like you're text messaging your girlfriend and your boyfriend and looking at ESPN. You have Torah on your phone also. It's not so far from you. You don't have to cross the ocean. Rather, the matter is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart to perform it. So what does it mean it's really close to you? Number one, what we just said. 
but he says it's in your heart, it's in your mouth and in your heart to perform it. So the pshat is, you pray with kavanah. You have a much easier time being Jewish. You have a much easier time keeping mitzvot. But a little more deeper, Hashem is telling you, not only is it not far from you, not only is it not difficult, it's actually doing tshuva, it's the easiest thing in the world for you to do. The easiest thing in the world for you to do is to do tshuva. The easiest thing in the world for you to do is to pray to Hashem, to learn Torah, to connect to me. Why? Because that's the only reason you were created. That's your function. That's your point. That's the only reason you exist. The phone's only purpose, really, was to make a phone call. Now it does a bunch of things. But in reality, it's only called a phone because it makes phone calls. It's not called a phone because it goes on the internet. There's plenty of other things going on the internet. What distinguishes this from a computer? The fact that it can call. Even though a computer also can call these days, but it's different. It's not, still not called a phone. Your computer will never be called a phone. The whole function of a phone is to make phone calls. It's easy for a phone to make phone calls. It's the point of the phone. The point of a Jew is to connect to Hashem. In the, by following the instructions from the manufacturer. Not his own instructions. So when you're telling me it's hard for you to keep this and keep that and keep this and keep that, it's nonsense. Why is it nonsense? Because Hashem said so. Not because I said so. Don't blame me. Hashem said it. I created you for this. To think that I created you and I'm giving you something you can't do, it's the worst kfirah in the world. So what I gave you I put you in this world just to fail? Just so I could destroy you and torture you? Why? What's the nafkamina? What's the point? Why would I do that? If I wanted to torture, just put you in Ganom. Have fun. You, Muhammad, JC, Hitler, all of you guys, hang out. The seventh Madoch Ganom. If I wanted to destroy you, have fun. I put you in this world to torture you? How can you believe such a thing? This is the point, my friends. And we'll finish with this point. You have to understand, Hashem put you into this world to sanctify His name. But how important it is for you to sanctify His name. How important is it for you to say even one word of Gdusha a day? Chazal says, It was enough of a reason for Hashem to create the world with all the stars and all of the universe and all the planets and all the rules of gravity and all types of other rules that we have, oxygen and so on, things that we have in nature. All of it. For one Jew, one Jew, one time to say... Amen. I'm sorry, it's the first time to say Bahu Bauch Shemo. And a thousand Bauch Bauch Shemo, a thousand Bauch Bauch Shemo, meaning blessing Hashem's name, is equal to one Amen. You go to Beknesset, Tefilat Shachrit. You start the prayer. It says, Baruch Hashem Mevorach. You say, Baruch Baruch Shemo. Right? Mm -hmm. For that, just say that one time. It was worth it for Hashem to create the world. For you. Not for the Al-Kila. Just for you. Just for you. Just for you. Baruch Baruch Shemo one time. Worth it for him. But you say, Amen. You say, Amen. So I say, today I said, Shekon Yemidvar on the water. Right? What would you guys say? Amen. Amen. For that, each one of you, 
It was worth it for Hashem to create the world a thousand times. A thousand times. A thousand amen, a thousand amen is the equivalent of one amen yeshen merabah. Say Kaddish. Kol Beknesset, somebody says Kaddish. In the middle of Kaddish, everybody answers, Amen, Yeshem, Rabba, Varach, Lalam, Lalmei, Almaya. One of those, Amen, Yeshem, Rabba, to Kaddish, that you could only say in a minyan. You can't say Tfilat Yechid. You go to the Knesset, you have a minyan, Kosher minyan, not Kofrim, you have at least ten Shomre Shabbat. You say, Amen, Yeshem, Rabba, that's the equivalent of a thousand Amen. A thousand amen. If you scream it, you cancel 70 years of zealot, right? A thousand amen yeshemir abba. A thousand amen yeshemir abba. Is equal to one word of Torah. One word. You read. Right now I wrote, uh, I read, a mitzvah. Top right of page, first word of chapter 30, verse 11. A mitzvah. That's the word. A mitzvah. That is the equivalent of a thousand. Amen yeshe meraba. A mitzvah azod asher anochim et savecha ayom. Lo niflet im imcha velo rechokai. Look how many times we created the world here in just reading one verse of Torah. One verse of Torah. If someone wants to just but listen to this though. So now that you know the value of one word of Torah. One word of Torah is worth more than all of this. But someone decides to make their own rules. And he says, listen, you know what? I'm going to take advantage of this. Psst. One word of Torah. One word of Torah is worth all of this. What am I going to do? I'm going to learn 24 hours of Torah. 24 hours in Torah on Shabbat. Shabbat Torah, learning sh uh, Torah on Shabbat is worth a thousand more than learning Torah during a week. It's worth a lot more. But I need to turn on the light in a Shinui. Like, if you turn on the light, obviously it's, you know it's an outright sin. But if you do, if you make a certain sin in a way that's different, for example, if uh, you, you, there's certain things that you're allowed to do, but only you have to do them different. Like, for example, clapping. Clapping. Gemara says, I believe it's in uh, Masechet Sota. Now let the clap on Shabbat. Now let the clap. The Ashkenazim mekilim bezeh. Ashkenazim are more lenient. When it comes to it, they clap. Some of them even machmirim. They clap a lot. <laughs> but the Sephardim, they don't clap. And the ones that clap, they say you're allowed to clap on Shabbat with a shinui. So you clap, instead of clapping like regular, you clap, you change the hand, you clap it in an odd way. But then it's allowed. Shinui. So the guy says, I'm going to learn Torah 24 hours on Shabbat, the best day of the week. The best day of existence. 24 hours, and I just need to turn on the light with a shinui. Not turning on the light right away. Eh, like with my elbow. Mabel. Which is not even a Yisur de Oraita. It's not even a sin from the Torah. It's a Yisur of Rabbanan. It's a rabbinical sin. It's not a biblical sin. It's a rabbinical sin. Or, if I don't turn on the light, I cancel out 24 hours of Torah. I can't learn Torah. It's dark. It's either I'm going to turn on the light and make a small, tiny sin of the rabbis. Bunch of rabbis, right? Rabbis. Small little sin on Shabbat. Or I cancel out 24 hours of Torah. I have power right now. I have energy drinks. I have this. I have that. To say Torah for 24 hours, you just said one word of Torah is a thousand years of Rabbah, which is, uh, is uh, 10,000 amens, which is uh, 100,000 boch boch shemot. I'm going to learn 24 hours of Divrei Torah. 20, you know how many words I can read in 24 hours? Millions of amends. Millions and billions of amends. 
for one tiny little sin, whether she knew it, it's not really that much of a sin, not worth it. Don't do it. Not allowed. Cancel the entire 24 hours of Torah and don't make a sin that's a rabbinical sin of violating Shabbat with a Shino even. Cancel out the reason for your existence, the reason for this world's existence, a hundred million times. And don't violate Shabbat even once. That's how important Shabbat is, but that's also how important you are. So you have to understand, when Hashem tells you, I have instructions for you, He's not only telling you this because of the reward, because of how important you are. He's also telling you, because if you don't do it, you're going to break it. You break it, you buy it. <laughs> Any questions? You said uh, last week, Ken. this year, Ken. about the amount of Jews that were living in Jerusalem. Ken. So I'm like, telling it to people, like, you know, people think I'm crazy. Like, wh where's the source for these numbers? There's Midrashim, there's Gemara, the, the there's... Gemara itself, does it say that, that these type of numbers? Okay, there's some of them, yeah. Could you send me the sources? Okay, so I'll show you the book. There's a book. There's a few books that talk about it. There's also Midrash Me'am Loez. Midrash Me'am Loez written well, by Rabbi... I'm the exaggeration of the Midrashim, right? No. Midrash Me'am Loez is uh, one of the best Midrashim there is. Is a uh, He uses hundreds and hundreds of sources. It's not like his Midrash, not his own words. Midrash Me'am Loez, if you look at the back of the book, it's a series of uh, 45, 50 books, you look at the end of it, it shows you the sources of every single thing, and you see there's footnotes. You read each paragraph, there's footnotes, and it shows you where he got everything. There's, you know, there's a one, so you go to the end of the book, chapter one, one, it tells you where the source is, what page number with this. Average book, you'll see no more than 500, no less than 500 different sources from Gemara, from Zohar, from all types of books, Shulchan Aruch, everywhere. So it's all sourced. It's not like he created out of his own mind. Uh, Rabbi Kuli was a tzaddik. Uh, Gamu, he, uh, before, he uh, would write. He would do something called a Tanit uh, Afsik, uh, which means he would stop eating Motzei Shabbat, eating and drink, he would fast, starting Motzei Shabbat until Friday. No eating, no drinking, until Friday. How many years ago was this? 300 years ago. Oh, the whole week. Do these type of the whole week. You would do it. He would do it. He did it a few times. I don't know how many, how many times he did it. He did it. No drinking, no eating for a whole week, but not all no eating, no drinking, and he's like us on Yom Kippur where we're like half dead. Half dead. He learned to lie and write the whole time. Non stop. Non stop learning. Non stop you know, uh, learning and teaching and doing everything but also not eating. Like I said before, when you are connected to Hashem, connected to the Torah, that's all you need. Everything else becomes meaningless. But it says, um, let's say this Midrash says, 100 million people left Egypt, and mm -hmm. that Midrash says, 5 million people left Egypt. Right. So, okay, Rafi says this, Mamluya says this. Uh -huh. So who should I hold by when I tell people about Yitzhak Mitzrayim? Well, generally, the most of Midrashim, they don't provide you really information that is, a, if there's different of opinion, it's not usually something that's monumental to such an extent that it changes Allah or anything. It's just a uh, detail. So, for example, whether there was 5 million people that left Egypt or 500 million people, it's irrelevant. You still have to be Jewish. You yeah, still yeah. have to uh, keep uh, Shabbat. You still have to keep Talat Mishpacha. You still have to not waste seed. It's, nothing changes. Nothing changes. So in general, as far as Midrashim and details, it's up to you, really, whether you want to believe it, don't believe it. I mean, generally, it's, it's part of the oral Torah. It's very much real. Um, but uh, some people have an easy time with it. Some people don't. Like, for example, if you look at the Midrashim about the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Yaakov Avinu, uh, if you watch the Shiro we did about it, um, they're the definition of superheroes. Now, someone like, for example, my uh, my dad. He doesn't really like mystical stuff. He doesn't like mystical stuff. I didn't like mystical stuff in the past either. I didn't like the stuff. Tell me this and this tzaddik made a miracle. I don't know, that stuff just didn't sound right to me. 
you know, there's a Gemara, a famous Gemara, with uh, an argument between Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkinos versus all of the Tzadikim. His opinion next to everybody else. And as a, there's a uh, Mishnah, there's a Mishnah in Perkei Avot, says that if you put the value of all of the Tzadikim, all of them, in comparison to just Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkinos, he outweighs all of them. He's more than all of them. Is he the one who said the big Kasher in Tamei? He would say Kasher. No. There was a big one of the rabbis. Maybe somebody he would, else. He would bring him something. He would say. He that was one of the rabbis of Rabbi Akiva, mm. and uh, it was a major, major tzaddik. The point is that one day there was an argument, and he said one thing. They said something else, and he says, "Listen, but you know I'm right." She says, "No, listen. The way that Allah is judged is based on the numbers." We have, we're, we're the majority of the rabbis versus one, we rule. He goes, yeah, but I'm right. You're, don't you? I says, oh, we don't take based on your, uh, what you think is right or don't think is right. He goes, okay, but if I'm right, right now, Hashem is going to split this tree. A lightning is going to come down and split this tree. And exactly that's what happened. A lightning came down and split the tree. And it said, we're sorry. We don't take, we don't learn halakha from split trees. Like, okay, if I'm right, the water on the river, the water on the river is going to start going backwards. Backwards. Going against the stream. The water starts going backwards. They say, we're sorry, we don't learn halakha from water going backwards. He says, he says a few other things, but then he gets to the last uh, miracle. He says, if I'm right, there's going to be a bat call. A heavenly voice is going to come down and say, I'm right. And a bat call came down. Why are you messing with my son, Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkinos? Don't you know that Allah is always like him? And he said, we're sorry. But according to our Torah, we don't learn halakha from a bat kol. We don't learn halakha from bat kol. We learn halakha based on the rules that Hashem gave us. Majority here wins. Later on, one of the tzaddikim saw the Yawa Navi. The Yawa Navi would appear and ask him this big argument that they had Rabban Gamliel versus Rabbi Eliezer ben Hokinos. You know, they put him on cherem after that. They, kicked, they said, listen, because you went against the rabbis, that's it, we can't take your judgment anymore. They put him away. And said, they ask, uh, they ask, uh, what did, uh, what was Hashem doing when this miracles. craziness was happening, these miracles were happening? What happened at the end when the butt call came down and which in essence is like an echo of Hashem's voice. It's not his voice, but it's like an echo of it. What was he doing when we said, no, Allah doesn't go by him? He said, Hashem was laughing. He said, my, I tried to trick my sons, but they beat me here. They followed the Torah. They did right. They were right. Allah does not come from a bad call. So, this is a cool story. What happened to him? Well, he continued. He ended his rest of his life. He was uh, not part of the uh, of the bedin anymore. I mean, but uh, there was another story where his wife was Rabban Gamliel's sister. So his wife knew that he was a big tzaddik. So every time he would pray, she would interfere with him. She would interfere his prayer because she knew. that if he prayed, start crying. And if he starts crying, people are going to die. Because Hashem will listen to his prayer. So every day she, before he would bow, she would always interfere with him. She would stop him from bowing. And then one day she got caught up with something, and when she came back, she saw that he bowed. And she starts crying and screaming, saying, Oh no, my brother is dead. My brother, Rabban Gamliel, is dead. And then shortly after, somebody knocks on the door. He's like, I'm sorry, ma'am. 
זה ביג צער עם עם ישראל, גדול הדור, רבן גמליאל is dead. So רבי עזר בן אוקרנו says, how do you know? How do you know? Were you a prophet? She goes, no. I knew that your prayer is very big in Shemaim. And I knew that as soon as you feel sorry a little bit about anything, Hashem, Hashem will avenge your blood. Without it, you didn't pray for him to die, Chas Shalom. But he still felt sorry that he's alone and he's not part of the Badin. They kicked him out and so on. So Hashem didn't like it. That took a life. That's how big he was. That's how big he was. Gemara, Gemara, without Hashem, you learn Gemara, you learn all this. So, now, the story, this very same story, it's a very cool story. It's a very nice story. But I have to do tshuva because of this story. Why? Because the first time I heard this story, my brother, Gabi, told me this story. He was trying to tell me the story. And I was like really, really early in my tshuva. Very, very early in my tshuva. I was completely not into mystical stuff. I didn't like it. Wasn't connecting to it. I thought it was crazy. I thought it was made up. Never learned a page of Gemara Bechlal. Didn't know anything. Not that I know that much now, but this I didn't know. So he starts telling me this story. He was doing tshuva, Baruch Hashem. He was much stronger than me. And he starts telling me the story. I'm like, ah, listen, I, I don't know this stuff. Just, just, I'm just focusing on Pirkei Avot or whatever I was learning over there. Just focusing on something else. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. And I heard him. I know I, I, I offended him because I didn't want to hear what he was saying. I know I offended him. And I'm, honest, I'm sorry for it. Because ever since that day, I can't stop thinking about it. I haven't stopped thinking about it, of how wrong I was. Because whether you like it, you don't like it, it doesn't make a difference. It's Torah. Be quiet. Listen. That's it. You understand? So, it's very, very important for us to know there's, per there's certain types of Torah that you're going to connect to. Certain types of Torah that you're not going to connect to. It doesn't mean that Torah you don't connect to is not true. It doesn't mean that Torah you don't connect to is not good. It means you're not ready. You understand? You're not ready. I make sauce once in a while, whenever I actually have time, not anymore for a long time. Spaghetti make sauce. sauce, spaghetti, you know, different sauce. Now to make sauce, you can either just throw a bunch of tomatoes in there or tomato sauce in there and that's it. Heat it up, it's fine. Or you can make sauce. Sauce, you have to put some sugar in it, you gotta put some salt in it, you gotta put a little tavlini, you gotta make some nice sauce. But if you put everything at the end, after it's already cooked, it's worthless. If you put everything in the beginning, it's also worthless. Everything has timing. Everything has to be put at a certain time. Everything has to be put at a certain quantity. Same thing with your Torah. If you just started keeping Shabbat, you start learning Chumash, and now all of a sudden somebody tells you, oh, you want to go learn Zohar? Run. Run. You're not ready, my friend. It can ruin you. It can ruin you. You're going to learn something that's going to mess your mind up. You're not ready for it. What do you think? They have a hospital in Halanov for crazy people for no reason? Most of the attendees were people that learned Zohar before their time. It's not a joke. I did something I told you a few weeks ago, uh, like for a few days. Okay, so you didn't listen to my advice, and that's what no, happened. I was teaching it in the class that I was. And I don't learn, don't there. listen. Basic stuff, yeah, you make a, somebody mentions uh, Zohar as a source, yeah, but the, the really, really stuff, the stuff that's. Let so me do tikkun it's good to clean the soul, I heard. You know what's the best thing to clean the soul? Learn Torah. Basic, basic, basic level Jew, basic level Jew. All this stuff of like high level stuff, going to some kfar, going to some woods and praying there, going to a cave, asking for names of angels that's mentioned in the Zohar. I don't know, doing all these different things that... Learn some Gemara, learn some Chumash, learn some basic Alachot. Do that for the next 25, 30 years. Then we'll talk about the other things. First, learn one Masechet. One Masechet. One. Now I'm not talking about a hundred. One Masechet. Have an understanding of it. Not even by heart. Have an understanding of the entire Masechet. One book. You see, this is Masechet Abu Dazara. has two books. 
It's uh, 70 something page, 75, 76 pages for the Gitar Masechet. So it's two books. Learn Masechet Abu Dazara to a point where I can ask you any question about this Masechet. Any question. And you know the answer. One. One. Then we'll start talking about something else. It's not easy. It's not easy. I'm telling you. It takes a long time. You have to become Biki. Biki means an expert in the entire Gemara. In the entire Chumash, in the entire Tanakh, in the entire Shulchan Aruch, before you even think about Zohar and Kabbalah and all this other stuff. There's certain things you're just not ready for. This is the reason why also I've been thinking more and more about this shiur that people ask me about this genome. 99.999% of people are not ready for it. And the people that think that they're ready for it, they're not ready for it. Because every time I make, I mention something that happens in Gainome, everybody's like, it's horrible. It's horrible. So what I decided that I think I'm going to do is that here and there I'm going to throw a little fact. Here and there I'm going to throw it. Like last week in the uh, Shio and Thursday, we, did, uh, we, we, we talked about Lashon Ara, what happens to people who do Lashon Ara, or people that steal from Hashem. They feed them sand. But their tongue, they hang it to the ceiling, all types of things. You know, so that's one thing that people get scared of. Okay, so the Dr. Shem, they do tshuva for that. I'm not going to go into the details, but for sex crimes, they do the same thing, but just with the sex organs. Anyone, I'm a vin yavin. Instead, so it's not for everyone. It's not necessary. You learn the basics. You be a basic level Jew. That's all you need. That's all you need. That's all you need. Oh, you need basic, beautiful Torah, learn Parashat Shavua, maybe learn your Parashat for your Bar Mitzvah by heart. Whenever your Parashat for Bar Mitzvah is, may actually learn it by heart, but actually know what it says, understand what it says, learn Rashi, Tosfot, Rambam, learn Mishnayot, learn some Musar every day, learn how to have patience, learn how to have manners, learn how to be a human being. Learn that. Learn that. Without being a human being, your Torah is considered to'ava. Your Torah is considered disgusting. You can have all, you can know all the verses in the world by heart. You have gava, you have no manners. It's worthless. Worthless, well, much worthless, what it says in the Torah. So you have to understand that the key to Torah is to make you into a human being. Once you become a good Jew, you become a human being, then you can build on it. But if you don't learn Torah, or you just start making your own rules, then instead of worrying about doing tefillah on Rosh Hashanah because it's Judgment Day, what are you going to worry about? You're going to worry about buying a, a, a white suit so you can wear it to Bet Knesset like people do. They buy a white suit. Guy just did tshuva six months ago, he goes to buy a white suit goes to buy a white suit so you can go to Beknesset because in the old days they used to wear white. So you heard about this and you know him and his friends go buy white suits. They barely know any mitzvot, they barely know any alachot, they barely know anything from their life. They still act like animals, they still have no manners, still nothing, but they want to go buy a white suit. Why don't they just look at what Rabavadia, Bdola Do. Look at what he did. Did you ever see him wear a white suit? No, why not? Because he wrote in his book, in our generation, someone that wears a white suit, whether it's on Shabbat or on Chagim, is chutzpan. This doesn't belong in this generation. doesn't belong. doesn't belong. doesn't belong. doesn't belong. Oh, Vadya says, no, he doesn't wear white suits. It's not style. It's not, it's not, it doesn't belong in our generation. Huh? The long white Hasidi thing. White suit, I'm talking about. White suit, oh, white suit, not the, yeah, white suit. So again, it's a, it's, we you have to stop worrying about the external stuff. We have to stop worrying about the things that are far away from us. You know, the things that we have no idea what they even are. Focus on the basics because the basics themselves are so significant that even if we learn them every single day, night and day. 24 hours a day. For the next 500 years, we still won't know all the basics. That's how big the basics are. 
That's how big the basics are. And self, and self. Rabbi Yehuda ben Holkinos, the same rabbi that made all these miracles. After many years that no one, you know, he didn't come to the Beddin, he didn't come to the Sanhedrin, nothing happened. Rabbi Akiva came to visit him. Rabbi Akiva came to visit him, and he was angry at Rabbi Akiva. Because how come he didn't come visit me all these years? Because, you know, for the Rav, the, uh, the Chachamim, they distance themselves away from you. They're losing out. So, you know, I, had to, I can't really go against them. You understand? He says, yes, but they have so much Torah to teach you. Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, Moshe Rabbeinu saw through prophecy, Rabbi Akiva teaching. And he was teaching the secrets of the Torah through the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Letters of the Hebrew alphabet have crowns on them. He said the crowns have secrets. Secrets about the world from the crowns. He was teaching from us. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I don't understand what he's teaching. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I don't understand what Rabbi Akiva is teaching. And then he, said, he tells Hashem, why don't you give him the Torah? You know so much Torah. But then he sees that Rabbi Akiva says, and this is the Torah we got from Moshe Rabbeinu. Meaning it's the same Torah. It's not a different Torah. He just expanded it and developed it. More and more secrets were revealed. So this Rabbi Akiva that has secrets from the crowns of the Torah,